TFM. This episode of the Ready Room is brought to you by Audible.com, your source for the best audiobooks, including unabridged readings of the latest novels from the incredible family of Star Trek authors. To get a free audiobook of your choice and help this show and the network at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And if you want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode, join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type Babel, B-A-B-E-L, into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. Hi, this is Michael Dorn, Lieutenant Commander Worf from Next Generation and Deep Space Nine, and you're listening to Trek FM. Welcome to The Ready Room, show number 228, Real World Star Trek Dripping In. I'm Christopher Jones, and with me today is Larry Nemechek. In this episode, we pay a visit to the insignificant little USS Cerritos as its journey reaches mid-season to share our thoughts on this animated rendition of Star Trek, the comedic elements, recreation of the 24th century aesthetic, nods to Trek past, and much more. We can't meet in the bunk corridor because that guy in a towel keeps walking by, so instead, let's step into the ready room. Well, Larry, I thought I would find you here in the ready room, but I have to say I'm a little bit disappointed in your attire. I told you that we were going to come up here because we can't do the show down there in the bunk corridor because that guy keeps walking through in his towel. <laughs> and now here you are in just a towel. What's going on? I Well, I was afraid you'd mistake me for towel guy. Um, yeah, <laughs> down in the corridor. No, it's fun. I love this. It's so funny. It's so zany here in your ready room these days, Chris. It just it looks all cartoony. It's so f- much fun. The bright colors, the simple lines. I love it. It's such a classic yeah. feeling. How do you like the uh, battered California state flag that I have over there? You That's know, the very old Bear cool. Republic. Yeah. I think it was must. I think if we could put a trace on that, and because I know it's obvious, it's not replicated. It's obviously an archaic, actual historic. It must be from 2020. It's been through. It looks like it's been through a pandemic and the fires and heat waves. <laughs> right, and- it does. It looks like it was flying above a building when it was 49.8 degrees Celsius, or. Whatever it was there, 110 Fahrenheit or whatever this week. It was 121 in Woodland Hills, which is like, no, we got up to 111 and then 115. It was very weird. There were just little inversion spikes. Yes, it was strange. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, we are here in this nicely drawn ready room because Mm -hmm. finally Lower Decks, we're at the midpoint of the season. Last time we... Well, on our last show, we mentioned that after one more episode, we would talk about it mid-season. And when we last talked about it together in depth here on The Ready Room, it was the weekend before the premiere. So we were speculating on what we might see with this new animated Star Trek series and the comedy. And now we have half a season under our belts, and it's time to share our thoughts on it. Uh, I'm just, I'm sorry. You probably don't even want to hear what I have to say because it's so, uh, damn boring. <laughs> I was excited <laughs> for Lower Decks. I had an exact idea what kind of humor it was going to be. It's been everything I thought and more. And the visualization, as I think I said last time we got together, has been way more than I expected. Yeah. It's a very loving tribute to that era, to the next gen era, even though, like somebody pointed out, they're still using season two phasers and they haven't gone to Cobra Heads and the, you know, the movie era phasers that came in, which technically mm-hmm. they should be doing. But the Cerritos is kind of an old ship and the replicator files are a little behind. Well, so. they don't even have T-88s yet, Larry. So <laughs> I mean, what do you expect? What do I expect? I know, I know. I mean, they don't even have the cool new tricorders with the purple stripe. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Mariner has to have an energy being basically squeeze one out for her, <laughs> shall we yeah. say? <laughs> she, you just thought she was being belligerent, but she knew exactly what she was doing. Hey, that's one of those purple tricorder squeeze and energy floaty <laughs> beings. <laughs> They're all. I really love that. Yep. 
they're all talking no squeeze until you put <laughs> put, the, you put the screws to them. Yeah. Well, there's a little bit of you know 20th century in there too. Batteries not included. You actually have to ask for those separately. <laughs> yeah, the power cell. I, listen, there's a – well, I have some thoughts as we get into the season, especially the later shows. I think it's – they're obviously having so much fun. That team, the different writers that are cranking these out, I mean, and Mike is acting like, you know, the, he's the head writer, showrunner. He's putting the polish if need be. And it's animation, which is a little bit different world the way – script writing and then into the visualization works. It's a little bit different than just, you know, standard uh, live action is. But still, they're having – they've got a big writer's room and they're just having way too much fun. And I don't know if uh, – we know that some of the writers – still learning them, but some of the writers are big-time next-gen fans and Star Trek fans. Some of them are newbies to Trek, but they're great animation writers. So Mike is, like, you know, putting a polish – a polish draft, <laughs> a polish edit on things. Mm -hmm. But there's so much packed. The thing about these being 22 minutes, people early on are getting used to the pace and the comedy and whether they like the sense of humor or the style. But one thing is for certain, whether you are like totally in love with them or you're just watching them and watching it evolve and you're a little more, there is so much in them. I mean, people talk about the yeah. Easter eggs and I say it's not all Easter eggs. It's, it's using the universe in a lot of fun ways. Either way, however you look at it, they're like zooming by. I mean, it's amazing how much they cram in. You know, yeah. the the heightened comic dialogue is one thing and cramming into the yeah. plot in the 22 minutes. But it's amazing how much just stuff there is, fun stuff to sit and go through. And you can watch two and three times and just pick things up. Well, exactly. I've watched – I think at this point I've probably watched all the episodes about six times and mm -hmm. I'm still picking up on new things. And now I've turned the subtitles on because so much stuff goes by so quickly. Oh. I want to see what's in the text, actually, to help pick up things. I watch with the text from the beginning. And maybe somebody will shoot me over that. But uh, there's just so much going on. And I don't have time to make six six approaches right now. Yeah, so, right. Um, yeah, yeah. But it's an interesting point because, you know, in preparing to talk about this with you, I wanted to do what I would normally do, which is to make more detailed notes. And uh, and I do those notes, like for Discovery, I did notes from the edge where I look for the connections mm -hmm. to past Star Trek. Mm -hmm. And then I talk about those key points. Because in an episode of Discovery, maybe I find four or five nice hooks into past Star Trek mm -hmm. that I can mm -hmm. explore and kind of expand upon. Here, it's just continuous. So what, what do you choose? You have to really think about what you would choose. And even if you want, and I know there are people who we know who have made it like a weekly thing where mm -hmm. they will do either a written or a video or an audio summary or recap of all of, like you said, many people call them. You didn't see? There's 46 different new podcasts out every week now talking about just the <laughs> Easter eggs, quote unquote Easter egg. Chris, I want to see a second season. Yeah. I want to see a second season episode because they're already all done for the first season, obviously. I want to see a second season where we go in someone's ready room or their court or their bunk <laughs> yeah. and they have a shelf on the wall and is full of Easter eggs. <laughs> So people Actual can say, Easter wow, eggs. did you see the yeah. Easter eggs? That one's kind of blue and this one has like a, a stripy pattern and this has got kitty animals on it. And that one had well, a little bit of a crack, but it was gold plated. It was a Rothschilds <laughs> right from ancient Earth. Yeah. Well, you know what will happen with it being Lower Decks, Larry, is that as we see that – Kind of in the background in the corridor, we'll see the rabbit from Shore Leave zip by. Mm -hmm. And deposit some. <laughs> I, I have to say with Lower Decks, I do not want to watch the rabbit deposit eggs because I have a feeling <laughs> how that might happen. <laughs> it, but it would be animated, so it's fun. No, and then whatever happens, either Tendi or Boimler will run through and like break all the eggs and it'll be someone's prize right. Easter egg collection. And then I you think won't it'll have be Boimler. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Tendi messed up the sand, uh, the ascension trap for, or the ascension. <laughs> Tells the <art> computer, <laughs> colorful sand, room temperature. Yes. Computer, <laughs> colorful like, sand. They have to specify the temperature for everything. There's the episode where Boimler goes in. He's like, beer, big, hot. I, I mean, cold. <laughs> Everything's like, 
a hot bananas, hot beer. It, it's wonderful. Uh, they've got the, well, it's the Cerritos. But, but talking about the number of things in here, that's one thing that I, I do want to talk about a little bit. And maybe we, we should just do it right now because talking about concept to execution, like what mm-hmm. we thought we might see, what we expected versus what we've gotten and how well does it work and such. My feeling is that the execution has been really excellent and mm-hmm. I've really enjoyed the show. And there there are moments where I think the humor's kind of lame or it's a bit too much, but overall I think it's been quite good. And one feeling that I have, however, is that they're packing so much in to each episode, so many references. Mm-hmm. It makes me wonder if it's a bit too much, if it's a bit too frantic. Can they keep this up uh, for an entire season or two seasons? Uh, Do we want them to? Do we want it to calm down? It's only 10 episodes a season, Chris. (laughs) They're not keeping this up for 26 hours. It's only 10 half hours. Yeah. But my feeling as a viewer sometimes is that there are too many references. It's just too constant. And then sometimes there are references that... There's one in particular where they're on the planet. Uh, it's I think it's temporal edict, right? Where they go down to the planet and it's the mm-hmm. uh, the race that worships the crystals, prizes right. crystals and all. Mm-hmm. And the guys come out with the spears and Mariner says, hey, what is it? Am I Kirk? Is it the 2260s? Yeah, yeah. And I just felt like she wouldn't really say that. Like no person would act actually say that that was like jamie cromwell saying you're on a star trek yeah that that one kind of felt like too much of a reach for me that we've just got to get that reference in there uh so just a small thing but there are those moments where it's like that most of the time it's just constant references flying by does it feel too much to you too frantic well, I think I think it ebbs and flows, and some episodes are more so than others. And what I've noticed is, if I'm watching one, most of the time they're easily accessible. Sometimes they're more obscure, mm-hmm. and maybe my maybe my obscurity threshold is higher or or lower, whatever, than a first time watcher viewer, whatever. But most of the time, if it runs through, you know, uh, and then I thought you were a brain infiltrator. I mean, it's kind of like, okay, well, That's if you're a big quick. DS9 yeah. fan, I mean, there's some things that are just blurps, like they just zoom yeah. by. Some things are a little more. When she's doing, when when uh, Mariner's manically doing her Glenn Beck, you know, conspiracy wall or, or you right. know, name, a, name a criminal procedural show of the last 10 years that doesn't have the psycho with his wall. Right. When she's doing that and she's pointing out all kinds of things. That kind of pace is is another thing, but generally it feels like when they throw references in for texture, I can pretty much pick them up and process it as they fly by, except for then when there is something that flies by that it doesn't ping me right off, I go, wait, is that, did they come up with a new word? And it feels uh-huh. like a, a new proper name, a new species, a new planet. And I feel like the ratio is like, Four to one. It's like you're about the time you're uh-huh. used to her spewing all these little Easter eggy references back in time. Uh-huh. A new one flies by and it's like, uh, oh, wait, that was a new one. And like the only thing I ever want to do is go go chase the new one that I think is a new a new word or, you know, a new proper word. Mm-hmm. And and it always is. But it always makes me that that, that takes me out that and wanting to frame grab. <laughs> the things. Oh my I God, see. look, it's their bunk numbers. But the only thing that makes me stop and, and what I have to make myself just sit and enjoy and watch on the first watch is like, yes, that's probably a new reference. Just enjoy it. Look, they're adding to canon. They're adding to the canon. They're not just regurgitating old fanboy, fangirl bits. Right. So I'm, yeah. and it yeah. seems like it's about four to one, and I'm fine with that unless it's. You know, the things that are proper to the actual, like Mixtus 3, you know, and then we don't get all the names of the moons and they just keep it to the planet names, which is still funny in the last one, in Cupid's errant arrow with the with the moon that's mm-hmm. descending. Yeah. But when it's like the proper names around the A and the B plot around that episode, that's one thing, especially when it's Mariner just spewing <laughs> stuff. She seems yeah. to be the one that's doing it most when you She's really go and analyze it. She's the one that does it most of the time. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of the Definitely. things that yeah. have upset people at the beginning, like the very first, the yeah. teaser and the first week of the show, and she's drunk at a star base, and that's that's not what would happen with cadets. And I was trying yeah. to say, well, now let's go back and think about Chekhov or Roe or when they were young. What would Could we right. see that happening? 
But also, I think we're getting to see that, just like I tried to say with the with the one admiral we saw in Picard, it's not like, don't take this one moment, this one character, and broad brush it to everything. Mariner is not representative of where the current young generation is in Starfleet. It's just, no. it's just her. Well, yeah, and not at all. And in fact, her character is set up that... She's an ensign now, but she Mm -hmm. was higher in rank and she Mm -hmm. does have experience and she's been demoted Mm -hmm. largely because I think she doesn't want to be anything other than an ensign. And, but she has all this experience. It's only, it's only, don't you think it's only mother, it's only mommy issues now that she's on the Cerritos. But when she wasn't on the Cerritos, it wasn't mommy or daddy issues. It was just her. Yeah. Her right. bumping yeah. her head on the not wanting to be which is why it's funny, like in in Aaron Arrow, she looks at, at at Barb and goes, She's a lieutenant. I mean, there's little times when it kind of gets her. You feel like maybe the years are going by. How you know, how yeah. many years has she been around? Well she makes a comment. She said she served on five ships, I think. Mm-hmm. Is that right at the beginning? So yeah, but how how many years she's been around in Starfleet? I don't think that's been specified mm-hmm. yet. Or if it was, it went flying by. Well, she goes back to the gray whenever the whenever the gray top. Now look, we know that within this is uh, what twenty three eighty, and we know within seven years they'll be wearing the uniforms we see Picard and and Raffi wearing in their flashback. And mm-hmm. they're being very anal. It's not just like, oh, do a different uniform for every show. I mean, they are specifically slotting these things into years in the big picture, in the Alex right. Kurtzman big picture. And they're here. And we see in the one flashback, we see her on the Keto, which was her ship before this, where mm-hmm. she came from. We don't know where along the way. We don't know how long that incident was before she's transferred off the Keto to, to the Cerritos. But it gives you the impression that the great – maybe what the uniforms they're wearing right now are really kind of brand new. Within a year, it's changed is the feeling I get from that flashback. Yeah, the ones they're wearing right now. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. But they yeah. take great pains to show them, oh, look, everyone's yeah. in gray tops on the Keto docked at DS9, by the way. Yeah. So it's it feels like whatever happened on the – well, whatever happened to the Keto was within the last year or so. And another ship was still wearing gray tops. And whether it was a throwback ship – you don't get that impression either. You think it was a moderate, you know, at least the same priority level as the Cerritos or a higher one, like the Vancouver. So now here, look here, you've got little cannony things dripping and you've got real world Star Trek. There's a phrase for you. You've got real world Star Trek dripping into this quote unquote cartoony animated show. And people are people are wondering about that. So even with the heightened comedy, people are are thinking about these story points and trying to glean from that what, what everything means and where everything lays. They definitely are trying to make sure that the things that they show fit into the timeline accurately. There's extreme attention to detail Mm -hmm. being placed on the timeline and keeping things uh, accurate and as fans expect them here, paying homage. Uh, One thing I saw an explanation for, because when Mariner gets promoted to lieutenant, she gets a gold uniform. (laughs) <laughs> which doesn't make any sense, right? That she would get a gold uniform. My initial thought was that they did it more for visual reasons to make it clear mm-hmm. that she's in a different situation right now. But Mike McMahon this is explained, Thomas Riker, not Will right. Riker. <laughs> that, uh, yeah, but actually, it's very obscure. Mike explained that it was actually an homage to when Jordy. Mm-hmm. was promoted going into season two because his uniform color changed. Now, of course, he also changed <laughs> departments, so it made right. a bit more I, sense. Yes. But that was Worf apparently the what they thing. were going for here, which, yeah, and Worf did the same thing. And so, I, I, it's an interesting explanation. I don't think it really makes sense because she wasn't changing departments, but it does show the level of thought that they're putting into it where they're actually thinking about mm-hmm how a, a character's uniform color changed. Hey, why don't we throw this in as a little homage to that? Well, visually, it was also, yeah, it was, yeah, that's cool that it was an homage, that they didn't yeah. make her sciences. They made her ops, which is closer to where she comes from than sciences. Although she, yeah. see, this is the thing about about Mariner and why she's just kind of a mess to herself. She's not representative of the whole generation of incoming young Starfleeters. They're all 
pretty much. Mm -hmm. Even on the Cerritos, they're all pretty hardworking. But she's her own thing. And some of those initial instincts, people were... They, you know, they were they were expanding what she was doing to all of Starfleet or all of young Starfleet or all the young ensigns. And it's like, no, this is as we've seen week after week after week. This is just her being a mess. But at the same time, I love in that where she's she can spew Technobabble with the best of them. And mm -hmm. she's always she's always got the clear head in a crisis. And a couple of times she's been wrong or she's flown off the handle too soon. But we've seen her with Ransom, with the first officer, with the captain, with her colleagues. We've seen her jump in and have the clear eyed view of exactly what the in the best Star Trek spout the techno babble and get it done. <laughs> Figure out the puzzle and tech it at the same time. Mm -hmm. We're seeing yeah. her do that. So, you know, she's a smart cookie. You know, she's got the street smarts. If she could just right. get her attitude in tune. You know, she's like Roe on steroids a little bit there. If you made yeah. Roe wisecracking. Right. I can't picture Roe being wisecracking, but I know what you mean. <laughs> it's That's like why that, it's right? such an original character. <laughs> the other interesting thing about her is that when you watch Star Trek, you feel, especially like Next Generation, you feel like everyone in Starfleet is this super upstanding mm -hmm. person. They're like the best of humanity yes, and everybody's sir. perfect. And it's one thing we got away from on DS9 where we got mm -hmm. to see that people were a little bit more regular and not everything's perfect all the time. And maybe Voyager a little bit, although Voyager for me skews more towards the TNG style of Starfleet officer, especially right. after the first season. But Mariner represents probably what a lot of the people in Starfleet are, which is the point of Lower Decks, right? These are like the, or mm -hmm. the ordinary officers. So I think that – I think her character for me is a bit over the top. Of course, it's a cartoon, so that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But if if I think of it and I just scale it back a little bit, I think that – They've created a character that does a good job of portraying probably what an ordinary person in Starfleet would be like, mm -hmm. not the by the book bridge officer type people. And again, that is the point of the show. So I think they've succeeded in that, like that part mm -hmm. of the execution. I think they've succeeded quite well. But I think I I still don't I still don't want to just think she's going to be that role. I mean, that it's going to be static. I think they're going to let them grow a little bit. And yeah, mm -hmm. we're back to standalone episodes. So we'll be back into that trope of not having this tight arc because it's not an overall arc. It's a standalone, which is what everybody wanted. And animation, you especially like to think you've got that. Like, I don't know what the progression has been through these four or five. There are some minute ways. And the writers, just after the writers and all the animators get used to doing it, there'll be some shortcuts taken. Mm -hmm. It's like when I watched Corbomite Maneuver, <laughs> it is so slow. It's like we were later on watching edited transcripts of the missions because it's like every little increment is called out or asked for. And it's just like, oh, but it's because it was like the first production hour after the pilots. And then after a mm -hmm. while, they just inherently start taking shortcuts with basic processes, unless it was a new thing. We're seeing for the first time like a self-destruct signal or whatever, whatever a process countdown. Yeah, but yeah. point here being is it's just an, it's just in human nature. The more episodes you crank out with a team of characters, the more you're going to things are going to pick up a pace. And some of that is also about the arcs and human development. And and part of mm -hmm. this is we're talking all about Mariner. There's Boimler and and mm -hmm. it's really funny. It's like so far, Tendi, maybe it's the way it is because they are the command folks, the bees. We got the bees. And then it's I've started calling them Tendi for even though <laughs> Tendi oh, Ford, even Larry, though they're Larry, not a couple. Are, are, you, are you shipping Tendi and Rutherford already? Wow. Don't, don't, don't <laughs> say. Yes, I'm putting them in a big cargo container and I'm putting them on the next space dock. Um, yes, I'm shipping them. Uh, well, it's just, it's like on one hand, they're not a couple couple. They're platonic, at least supposedly they're platonic. And yet, so far, they keep getting the beast. It's like all the A stories yeah. go to the Bs. I'm just calling them the Bs. Beckett and Boimler, Beckett and Brad, Bradward. Um, <laughs> the Bs get all the right. A stories and the, and, and Tendy Ford gets the Bs. And I would, yeah. for one thing, I would like one week to have Tendy Ford. If they're all, and if they're never going to cross path, are we ever going to see the girls together or the guys together of the, of the lead four? 
Are we ever going to have yeah. the two of them tossed together? I mean, maybe that's coming in the second wave. Mike's already, Mike Mabahan's already talked about how yeah. there will be two or three major life, you know, I guess leading into a season finale ish kind of a thing, cliffhanger or not. But it's not just going to be la di da, Flintstone. The first ones are get, letting you get to know them. He's already said as we get toward the end of the 10, mm-hmm. um, there'll be some, some higher stakes and some more moments of drama or dramedy or whatever. Maybe like, all animated life in the entire universe could die if <laughs> Rutherford doesn't recalibrate the sensors. The sensor, the sense paddles, <laughs> right? That whole time I was thinking Spock said sensors all the time. Sensors not responding, joke. Captain. <laughs> sensors are saying it's there. Scanners are saying it's not. I mean, Spock said sensors. But that's the joke, the Clary. Time. Yeah, is, yeah, yeah. The, <laughs> well, for her to wig out anyway, the yeah. the. In a broad brush, in a in a big picture way, yeah. the only thing that I've not been happy with it, the only thing that's made me wince a little bit is, mm-hmm. and I've said this before, I think, when it gets, not not when they drift away from Star Trek, but the other conceit is, not about science fiction or Star Trek, but, you know, and Mike has said this too, they're, they're basically a sitcom, and a lot of fans have talked about how mm-hmm. it's like a either, you know, the classic workplace sitcom. Or the cl- yeah. like, you know, a Mary Tyler Moore or MASH or whatever, yeah. or Cheers, or, whatever. or it's the classic, the family sitcom. And you get touches mm-hmm. of that both. And especially when it's her and her mom, you kind of get that. Yeah. I'm still, here's a question. I still want to know why she's going by Mariner and her mother is Freeman. And if they're still stuck in 20, 21st century Terran lineal name tropes, has her mother, is, is the Admiral her second husband and it's her stepfather? Or is she just being rebellious and, you know, that's an interesting little thing that's just hanging out there apart from her, the enigma of yeah. her background that we're all wondering about anyway. Yeah. The family and the workplace humor and, and the fact that they get a little sitcom-y, like when her mom is like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to drive her crazy. So she wants to transfer. That is so sick. That's like six, 60s sitcom. <laughs> You know, not even yeah. today. And I kind of go, eh, but it's fine. It's heightened. It's comedy. I'll let them have that. It is old sitcom but it also reminds me of other animated shows from maybe 10 years ago or earlier. Like there are moments, one of my favorite animated shows is Phineas and Ferb, which is a, mm-hmm. a Disney produced show. And like Phineas and Ferb, those characters don't remind me here, but the villain in that show, Doofenshmirtz, <laughs> there are moments. Uh, there are moments in the writing and in the voice acting and all in lower decks that remind me of situations you would see mm-hmm. with him in Phineas and Ferb. So some of it is just, I think, this type of animated comedy style, especially mm-hmm. with the voice actors, and it comes across that way. Uh, I know what you mean there. I did have the same thought about the names, why they have different names, mm-hmm. and of course there are a number of possible explanations for that, and we'll see if we get them. It seems like the kind of thing they probably would not explain in an animated comedy series, but you never know. We might get that. You mentioned Tendi and Rutherford. Now, Rutherford did go to the trouble of considering transferring to many different departments (laughs) just to get closer to Tendi so he didn't have to spend all of his time crawling through the Jeffries tubes. So I think he likes her a bit. Mm Mm-hmm. It's well here, you know, it's like so much attention. This is another thing. They spent so much time with Beckett and Bradward that we, I mean, we kind of get, and Tendy comes across. Tendy was the original character, right? She was the entry point of view character in that. Well, aside mm-hmm. from that teaser, I almost don't even now. I, I think that teaser is like the promo trailer that we saw for ages and they tacked it on the front of the first episode. <laughs> It feels like. I oh, feel okay. like the first moment of, of second contact is Tendi getting off her shuttle coming aboard for the first time and with that clump uh, of other, you know, other new yeah, yeah, assignees. Yeah. They're not all ensigns. Some of them are higher rank, but they're all new crew personnel rotating onto the Cerritos. And she's right. but she's an ensign and she's all bug eyed. And she says this is the coolest ship I've ever been on. So she's an ensign. So maybe she's had at least we haven't had a lot of background on her. But she's the open. She's the the eyes that we see the ship for the first time as viewers, and they use her as that right. character and introduce everybody else at the same time as she walks around. But apart from that, yeah, I'm just I'm a little. I want to see them have the A story one week, and I want to mm-hmm. see. I've said this. I want to see them mix it up. But even there, I feel like we know 
What do we know about Rutherford aside from he just got his little wacky Borg implant attuned by Vulcans or whatever? I say Borg. Everybody calls it a, a Borg piece. It's a it's a Vulcan cyborgish implant. Right. But apart from that, yeah. what do we really know about his background? Not much. We know Tindy's an Orion and she's in Starfleet. Yeah. And he's we, he's obviously Starfleet and human, but we know I feel like we know a little bit more about her and her character. And she's like this twenty four seven upbeat optimistic person. Even yeah. when there's a dark side to that, like we saw. <laughs> but we right. don't know that much about Rutherford except he's just a big hunkin' engineering science nerd and loves his nerding out. Exactly. He reminds me of Jordy in mm-hmm. quite a few ways because mm-hmm. Jordy will become obsessed with some technical issue, like why mm-hmm. did this thing not work the way it's supposed to, or I need to recalibrate this, and can't talk to women and mm-hmm. Because we have that moment here with Rutherford where I can't remember the character's name off the top of my head, but the the trill that he went out with. Oh, Barnes. Oh, I've been rooting for her to come back. And she has been popping up now and then. And, yeah. and you know, she kisses him after they escape from the the zombies. And he's just more concerned about the door. And that seems like mm-hmm. the way Jordy would be in that situation as well. So I pick up a little bit of Jordy. You see a lot of characteristics of various characters rolled up together mm-hmm. in these four main lower deck characters that we have. Yeah. Yeah. Barnes is the trill named Barnes. <laughs> it's another case where I want to go, Barnes. hmm, could she, can, her spots are kind of, <laughs> now whether it's intentional not to, I mean, it's like, well, are they doing it to keep the animators from going crazy? A, I thought I heard it was digital. <laughs> and B, if Mike Westmore could paint those spots on Terry Farrell <laughs> for six years and then and then and then for a year on Esri, uh, on Nikki, like surely they can just draw them. But it seems like her trill spots are a little bigger. And so maybe it's like, well, that's just yeah. that's just adapting for animation because too fine. I think it's the animation style. That was how I felt. Or about it. Mm. or her mother was trill and her father was human because Barnes is such a blandly. Well, you know, Terran her, Anglo-ish her, name. Her father was a cyborg, Larry. Remember? I took it to mean he was a cyborg like Rutherford's a cyborg. With a, He's a human yeah. cyborg. Okay. He's a gotcha. human cyborg. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we have the technology. We can't improve it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, we haven't talked about the upper the upper character. Well, a little bit. We've talked again about Captain Freeman. I don't know where you wanted to go next, but I keep wanting to see – I just I keep wondering. Aside from one time, he said something about thank the prophets as a throwaway. Yeah, he did. Yeah, Shax is like the great unexplored of the seniors, you know, the senior staff. And I just that and him, you know, aside from blowing up the warp core as a joke line, <laughs> and aside from he's the guy who's always pushing back the door to keep hordes from coming in, right, or carrying people over his shoulder to get somewhere. Aside from that, yeah. we haven't really heard a lot about what makes him tick. No, he's got tiny hands, and it's hard for him to hold lattes, but... <laughs> yeah, we don't know much about him. And the fact that he's Bajoran, there's not much in his character That's what that I'm, reflects yes. Bajoran, right? He, he has the earring. He did say, thank the prophets, once. But otherwise, I don't know. So there's a lot to explore mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ransom very much feels like a combination of Riker and Kirk. Mm -hmm. With Jerry O'Connell thrown in, like real life Jerry (laughs) O'Connell kind of thrown in there somehow. Yeah. Yeah. His voice. And we've already seen him propping his foot up on stuff like Riker did, you know. Oh, all the time. Everywhere. Yeah. Uh, We've seen him rip his shirt off. (laughs) Yes. You know, Kirk's shirt would get ripped. Ransom just rips his shirt off himself right well it's a fight he's got to no ransom's had a yeah. spotlight show the captain's had a couple of spotlight shows and mm-hmm. and 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 uh dr Devana's had a vacation doctor's had a couple of spotlight moments including moments. when she yeah. does the haya sideways it's like, you didn't know vacation <laughs> martial artists were so doctors were so they're all they're so great they're all cross-trained yeah and and then there's andy billups mm-hmm. who's supposed to be the engineer. The chief engineer. Right. The chief engineer, yeah. yeah. Who's just like yeah. the plain, bland. I don't know if this is like an antithesis to Scotty or, mm-hmm. you know, like um, like Fred, the engineer character in, um, or that's his actor name, in Galaxy Quest. The whole point was he was like an anti-Scotty that was almost like he was drugged the whole time. Yeah. And, that's, and, and Billups is not 
you know, drugged. He's just kind of blandly competent Very, so far. Kind of bl- blandly yeah. competent. There you go. So the doctor, I did want to talk to you a little bit about the doctor. Yeah. Who do you see in this character? Because I see I see a lot of Pulaski. Mm-hmm. I see a bit of Bones. But of course, I see Bones in Pulaski. So that makes sense. Right, right. She talks about bedside manner. Who had the best bedside manner? Probably Beverly, right? Of the of the doctors, maybe Julian. Uh, yeah. Well, Julian upset people. If they were if they were Julian's good friends, he could irritate them. I never. You didn't see him really with. <laughs> I mean, you, right. in the quickening episode, you saw you saw him with you know comforting people who were really afflicted. It yeah. seemed like usually bedside. You saw so many, so few. Now you're Mister DS Nine, but just sitting here thinking, we saw so few bedside moments in the infirmary with people in a bed and if they weren't like quark or yeah somebody that was just injured that was a main character you didn't really see that much of it and uh, you know when you think of bedside manner not you think of the emh you think of, of picardo's doctor. <laughs> especially early on yeah uh yeah <laughs> so i yeah the 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 screechy scrouch it's like uh it is like pulaski on steroids of course i was never a big i never saw mccoy as is the curmudgeon that a lot of, I guess, the, most of the rest of the civilized world saw McCoy as. I always thought he was the down-to-earth guy who could wisecrack. Yeah, no, that's what I was going to say. I didn't see him as a curmudgeon. I saw him as a practical person. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You had Kirk, who was emotional. You had Spock, who was always concealing his emotions. And then you had McCoy, who was just the practical guy. Down to Earth yeah. guy, like you say, which is why the three of them work so well together. Yeah, I always liked McCoy because he was the down to Earth one, which yeah. I thought, you know. But exactly. um, don't I talk? And some of this, it's like in our vision of of Cations, Of course, all we know really is Morris. We've had other felinoids. I mean, well, the two we've got the twin the girls, girls that jumps alternate. on Kirk in what? Star Trek Five. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's supposedly whatever, but. The only real Cation character we've had is Mares, and the whole thing was her was the purring, right? Yeah. And she mentioned something about her litter mates or something. Went to, but it's her so litter little. Mates. It's such a soothing, yeah. soft thing. And Donna is yeah. like the end. It's like Mares is your perfect cat that you had one time, and then and then Donna is like the cat that was all claws and scritchy, but was so lovable you kept them around, even though. It you know it was like that kind of cat, not the other kind of cat. <laughs> and uh, but yeah. she's proved her worth many times here, and she's yeah, yeah she's got the the scrouchy, you know, the Pulaski bit to it. Still waiting on her to have a great moment though. Yeah, and there's also the uh, the the Cations who Kelvin Kirk slept with at the academy. But I am wondering yeah. if. They're going to do more with Dr. Ta'ana, though, because right now we only see her in key moments, which Mm -hmm. I guess is more like the next generation where we only saw Beverly in key moments versus... uh, It's the curse of the blue sweater overcoat. That's what it is. Yeah. (laughs) So I'm wondering if if we'll get to see a bit more of her, maybe where we got to see more of Bones in the original series. Right. It's almost as if her, her best moment was in the pilot was in second contact when they have the crisis moment and she's like scanning and, you know, and so much of that, that was like the B story, but so much of that was, uh, was, I love that was so, and I haven't seen, I mean, I, so much of what's funny about lower decks is when they take star Trek tropes. Like I said, we've had 10 years of people building Facebook memes on these things. Right. And all the, between the cracks, sarcastic, in family, you know, mm-hmm. poking fun, not bozos from outside, but in the, fa- that's what Lower Decks is. It's all, people are so worried about the comedy of Star Trek. It's like, well, what do you think people have been doing for 10 years for their own entertainment? It's, it's like, oh, it's okay. It's one of, one of us is doing it and they get it. And that's what tickles so many people's funny bones when they're being self-referential or not right. even when it's like an on the nose thing, when it's just a moment. And that's what just killed me, slayed me in the pilots when it's off of the lower deckers and it's actually on the senior officers when they're solving the crisis of the virus and, and they're ha- and the captain, the doctor, you know, are having one of those all important, the history of the, the, the future of the universe is hanging in the balance moments that Star Trek has. Right. 
And it's like, you'd better be, because you don't have much time. You'd better be sure about this. And then, you know, the drama moment and then the come down moment was, well, I guess you can write another medical paper about this one. <laughs> right. Oh, no, more paperwork. It's like another Flintstones moment. And how many times, you know, the doctor or Bashir would have one of those, oh, you can write this up and do it. I mean, not so much McCoy and not so much Beverly, but as as Trek yeah. wore on and people got, again, the tropes got it, – it, Starfleet life became more of a familiar thing to both the audience and the writers. So now Lord X is starting like from there going forward and it's really easy to make fun of some of those – those kind of right. throwaway, easygoing moments like that. And I love that whole little bit. There was such a mocking of the hyper drama. Here we're worried yeah. about heightened comedy and that. And, and we've had a little bit of it, too. And sometimes they just make an outright mockery like, oh, come on, Spears, guys, really Spears. Mm -hmm. Whether you say, what is it, the 2260s and it's Kirk? Whether you do that or it's just anything, it's just a moment where you go like the alien, the three or four alien factions not wanting the moon imploded. Right. And, and a little bit of modern reference there, too. I think this is all fake news and you've just made it up. <laughs> yeah. I, I love that mediating between the factions who don't want the moon to be imploded because that was such a next generation mm -hmm. storyline. It was exactly the kind of thing where the Enterprise would go to the planet and Picard would have to mediate between these two groups. <laughs> and then there is the episode where in The Next Generation where you do have a couple, just two people living on a planet by themselves. <laughs> exactly the same kind of thing like they're making fun of here. But they were not what they seemed. Exactly. I like yeah. the moments, yeah, when it's not completely on the nose, where it's not Mariner just spewing references, like on-the-nose references. I like the little moments like when Ransom is going to turn off the autopilot and fly the shuttlecraft down by himself. And he makes a comment and he says, oh, should have tried that with my ex. And then the Bolian <laughs> sitting next to him has this really nervous, like, ha ha, ha 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 laugh. And it's that moment uh -huh. where you you can imagine officers in that situation where the higher up person's there and they've got to fit in, but they feel uncomfortable. Those, those types of, of little references to situations I find more amusing than the on the nose. It's more organic of these characters and of these situations, yeah. Or when Boimler is explaining that he's going to get lost and have to eat bugs and he's going to die and then they'll have to figure out what happened to him based on his shaky video log. That's like an exact plot <laughs> yes. of a Next Generation episode, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's the thing. Yes, the, the trope of the... Uh, right. Can, I don't know, sir. Can you find... It goes back to uh, play back the ship's log from the Constellation. You know, you hear Decker's voice. Yeah. I mean, it's like that's an old, old, old trope or the or the yeah. logs from the Psy 2000. Oh, look, they're in the shower and they're frozen. Oh, right. Um, but the the thing I, I do, I also like well, a couple of things. One of the things that's amazing on this, and it's I never thought about this, is like they're it's fun to find, you know, the Vulcan and the Andorian. And yes, we finally got a Teller right. Mm. I've already been laughing about this. Durango. Durango. Really? <laughs> yeah. Durango. But you see a lot of familiar species and even the obscure ones that it's hard. It's hard to like simplify it down for the animation. Right. To and some of them were right. were glorified. Yes budgetary, you know, forehead aliens, but they still manage to find like the Hollians, like Aquiel, there's one on the bridge usually and some yeah. of the others. And it's people have been talking about the purple skinned one that looks like it's a couple times we've seen purple skin <laughs> original series even from Journey to Babel. And there's mm -hmm. one species that's light blue and people tried to identify it as a Tulian or a Turlian from the pilot of Discovery. The light blue ones, but they're not Bolian or Andorian or Benzite okay. even. Mm -hmm. We've seen Benzites and we've seen Bolians, but it's uh, they've got droopy pointed ears and they've got like gill slits on their cheeks. Oh, and yeah, they, yeah. They, and remember, they pop yeah. up all the time. There's sometimes on the bridge, sometimes the engineering. Yeah. But then there's one off. It's wacky finding these one off aliens that it looks like they're creating, you know, but the mm -hmm. other thing about those background aliens that's that's so much fun is they're definitely redrawing some of them, like O'Connor, that was the guy trying to ascend in Cupid's Air and Arrow. He had been, it's like, oh, he's the fluffy headed, the round headed haired dude that was in a few background, didn't, wasn't always voiced. A lot of these characters aren't always voiced, but they're very, you know, they're, they're, but you see them shown. recurring in the background. Yeah. yeah. But it's, it's like, it's just like next generation. It's like there's three or four people on the bridge all the time. There's three or four or five or six engineers in engineering. 
and people that are in ten forward and there's a few there's a there's a female she's in an ops yellow and she's got big brown hair that's kind of like I don't know looks like uh, Pam Dauber hair or something from Mork and Mindy mm-hmm. um, and she's <laughs> yeah. she sat next to them on the shuttle going down that ransom led I mean okay. she's it's that one but they don't have names but they're clearly not just drawing ran they're clearly using faces over and over again just like the live action shows on ships would keep a stable of, you know, eight or 10 or 15 extras. So it wasn't just a new face constantly every week. And you did get the feeling of family, except they're drawing them. And then you have, (laughs) after four or five weeks, oh, look, one of them talked. It's O'Connor. He has a name just in time to go off and and do the Star Trek trope of turning into pure energy. Yeah, when he wasn't going to, but then he did. Just what you would see on the live action series, right? Eventually, one of them will talk. And yes, eventually one talks. The other yeah. thing I notice, you know, we, we talk about Towel Guy in the bunk corridor. Uh-huh. The other thing I notice is that we used to often talk about how in the next generation, especially early on, you never saw Vulcans. And then they remastered mm-hmm. the next generation. And once the image was all cleaned up, suddenly you notice there were Vulcans walking in the background sometimes. And that happens in the bunk corridor here. Like this random mm-hmm. Vulcan will walk by. So even that feels like a joke reference to the <laughs> beginning of the next generation. Like, okay, we're not we're not gonna like focus on Vulcans, but we're just gonna have them randomly mm-hmm. walk in the background. Mm-hmm. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, the first time we have a real Vulcan speaking guest character. I, I I guess there's some solace there that we had a Tellarite guest character before we had a Vulcan. Is that right? Did we haven't had a Vulcan speaking guest character? Wow. Yeah. I'm so honored, Michael. <laughs> he did that for you, Larry, I think. Just just, just sure, for me, yeah. I'm sure he knows of your love of of Telar Prime. Uh, uh Telar Prime, yeah. Uh did you put the sensors on that one? So I you know, it's there's been again, there's been a lot of we were all, I think, braced to see how the transition A to animation and B what a quote unquote comedy would look like. Because comedy mm-hmm. has all kinds of different Animation. I mean, I'm really waiting on the Prodigy. Prodigy is going to be 3D animation, just technically a style difference. But also, I think the tone is going to be really purely more young adult, you know, mm-hmm. audience, more anime-ish well, feeling. I have a quick quick question. Yeah. You mentioned this last week, too, about young adult audience. What age group do you define that as when you when you say young adult audience? Well, I'm I'm thinking teens and tweens. And, you know, Mm -hmm. older, I mean, it can be, it can vary depending on the maturity of the kid. But what I'm getting at here is I think when I think of kids lower decks, I'm thinking of kids watching with their parents or parents getting their kids to watch it because it's Mm -hmm. so manic and there's so many references. And it's really an adult show. It's not about or for kids. The the heroes of Prodigy are all like teenagers, teenagers and cadet if they were in the academy. I mean, I'm thinking that they're like 15 to 18 or 15 to 20 year olds. I mean, I just, just the impression I get. It's young people okay. find a derelict ship. So the show itself is about that age range. And okay. a lot of times what you see in TV and, and, and novels, young adult novels are for, I don't know, 10, 12 years, depending on the maturity of the kid, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, really more of the younger end of that. And younger people reading stories about people just older than themselves. And mm-hmm. when you're that young, you know, two years is forever and four years is right. an eternity. So it's yeah. like people reading just the micro generation above them. And I think that's what Prodigy is going to be. Plus, it's going to be on Nickelodeon. So I'm not mm-hmm. saying it's going to be like Akira or anything or <laughs> or Valley of the Nausicans or anything. But I just I mm-hmm. as far as like hyper serious and tragic and all that. But I think there'll be a. It'll be serious with a with a humorous undertone to it, but I just think it'll be young adult aimed at okay. the characters so and the not, tone. Not as childish as some people might think with it being on Nickelodeon. I know. I you know I'm just talking out my rear end here. Yeah. I'm just going totally on spitballing this, and I haven't watched. I'm going to say this: I haven't yeah. watched Nickelodeon to see what the range is, and yeah. what time of day, and all that, and how they're programming yeah. Nickelodeon. I just know that it won't be the same as. I kind of thought this anyway, but now I'm Mm -hmm. thinking it's going to be – I think I can totally see how the tone will be different. The style and the tone will be different with Lower Decks than this. I'm pretty sure they won't be bleeping out profanity in Prodigy (laughs) as they do on Lower Decks. Well, I think – 
I, I I have no doubt that the voice actors are recording the word and they're bleeping it, but they're doing that for a reason. They're doing it to be funny. Right, right. Well, that's okay. This is a question I wanted to ask you. Actually, I think it would because... take away from the humor if they just let them say the F word and the S word and everything else, you know? Yeah. See, I know people have different opinions about the use of profanity in general and the use of profanity in Star mm-hmm. Trek. And what I have noticed is that since we started getting new series with Discovery, mm-hmm. now with Picard, mm-hmm. and now with Lower Decks, there's this use of profanity, which we did not have previously in Star Trek. Mm-hmm. And yes, I know that there have been some instances of profanity in Star Trek in the past, but not like what we've been getting in these newer series. I'm personally not offended by it, but I also don't think that it's necessary for the story. Now, when they did it in Lower Decks, the first time, like, Dr. Ta'ana says, I'm not going to say it on here because it's a word that we would have to beep on here, uh, and I want to keep our feed clean, but... It's a word, it's on the, the weird list of FCC words in the United States that you can't mm-hmm. say on TV, which is really nothing compared to the ones that you can say. And when she said it, I thought, that's a joke. They're making fun of the fact that you can't say this word on TV. That was how I took it. Mm-hmm. But then there are other instances of profanity here and there. And then there are words that you can say on TV with no problem, bitch being one of them, which, of course, is profanity in one usage and is just a a normal word in other usages, depending on the setting. Here it's being used as profanity. I think they use it too often on Lower Decks. I don't think it's necessary. At the same time, I can imagine that these characters who are in the Lower Decks of the ship yeah, pr- probably they might speak that way. Just like the uh, the workers that we see on Mars in Picard, mm-hmm. in I think it's a, is it Maps and Legends where we get the the flashback, right. the flashback, to the yeah, attack. The second, yeah, the way those people, those workers, speak to each other and the profanity that's in there, I think that's probably realistic for the setting. So, uh, I, I, they're I not just, even on a deck, Chris. They're just low. They're so low. They're on <laughs> right? a planet. I find it interesting how often they're using profanity in this animated series. And sometimes it's funny. And then other times I feel like it'd probably be better to just Mm -hmm. not do it. But that's just me. I don't know. How do you feel about it? I, like I said, I think the times they've had profanity and bleeped it, A, you can tell what word it is. You get like that, that you get that. You get the the beginning, uh, you hear a little bit. Yeah. 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 A little bit of the consonant. You hear a little bit of the. Yeah. Or the, yeah. the at the end or whatever. But I think it's more it's funnier to have it bleeped and yeah. feel like we're watching this through a filter or a lens. I mean, it, it constantly reminds you. Well, you know, because it's animated. But, yeah. you know, what? I've noticed something, Chris. Even the live action shows aren't really real. Because <laughs> I've been told Larry. it's like filmed entertainment for us to enjoy <laughs> and ponder really? the meaning of. Don't don't I it's I there's times I wake up in the middle of the night and I break out in a cold sweat and wonder. So <laughs> it feels what funny to say this lower decks is not real, but I I feel like part of the heightened and again you could have yuck 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 humor. But this yeah. is you know, this is like a manic nonstop and a lot of the humor comes totally out of the Star Trek situation. We're laughing. We're right. laughing yeah. at the Star Trek intellect. We're laughing yeah. at the fact that it is a Star Trek trope and they're doing it so well. And it is you know, like right out of Mike's eighth season of Next Generation. It's that style. And part of that style is like, and I don't know if this is a, I haven't watched enough modern animation, you know, cre- like, you know, I haven't watched enough Rick and Morty. I should, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to know if that's a trope. If, if, if bleeping an obvious expletive is supposed to be funny. Or that's part of the that's part of the universe of watching the show as a viewer. Like in their reality, no one's bleeping their words, but this is a this is an overlay to remind you that you're watching something. But since that makes no sense, then that's why it's comedy on, on some very snarky 
grim humor level. I probably am talking mm-hmm. in circles. This is my moment to be not know where I'm going with this. But I, I think part <laughs> of the, I think part, I think if they, if at some future point you get DVDs and there's an option on a DVD to turn off the bleeping and just let them okay. curse, like yeah. no one's going to listen to that. Like no one cares. And it's not like, oh, my, my ears are tender. It's like, it's yeah. not as funny as hearing it bleat. And we've given up a little bit on the this is really in the 24th century because – but then all of Star Trek does that. I mean, all of Star yeah. Trek tries to be two and 300 years from now, and we know it's not going to be that. Who knows how we look compared to the Shakespeareans, you know? You can look at it, analyze right. it, and break it down, but lang- even English, quote-unquote, has changed so much. And we've changed so much in 20 years, much less 50 or 100 or 400. So, mm-hmm. anyway – yeah. So yeah. there's that's the downside okay. of it. So you you have that it's, conceit. You know it's going to be there, and still, and Tendi and Rutherford and Boimler are so not that way, right? <laughs> that it you yeah. know again it's all oh, that's just that's just you can kind of, you can come back to oh that's just Mariner, yeah, or that's just Taana because she's the other yeah. character who does mm-hmm. does that pretty often, and and in, in that respect, it probably does fit her character pretty Mm -hmm. well. So my feeling on it is that there are moments where I think it's appropriate and I'm fine with it. And then there are moments where it happens. And I think, yeah, I probably would have left that out because it actually, for me, is distracting to the situation. It's, Mm -hmm. I say it's distracting. It's not like it ruins my day or anything like that, but it just, I feel like- Just that micro moment. Yeah. When I think as an editor, I feel like if that weren't there- Everything f- flows more smoothly, and you don't have that distraction. But I, I have that more with Mariner than with Taana. Not to belabor yeah. this any longer. Yeah, right. Most of Talana's, yeah. I think, just come across as she's like Pulaski she's on steroids. She's just gruff. Yeah, and yeah, do, are, exactly. are, are all older <laughs> Cation doctors? Uh, this, you know, this commercially. That's a, this. That's a very specific subset of. Star Trek characters that we have not explored. Maybe that's a future a whole series. series. I want a whole series <laughs> on aging Cation female doctors. Yeah. Cation hope. Yes. <laughs> L- let's talk about, while we're talking about all the different aliens, maybe we've kind of covered this, but I did just want to point out the diversity that we see on the ship. Oh, hell yeah. Oh, sorry. We... <laughs> I'm going to have to beep you there, Larry. You, oh, no. You realize that. <laughs> we, we've seen more diversity in Discovery, and we've seen more diversity mm-hmm. in Picard. And it's uh, largely a result to the fact that through CGI these days and also refinements to make makeup techniques and so forth for prosthetics, it's a lot easier and more cost-effective to have these aliens on the ship. But what I really like about lower decks because we're very much in that TNG DS9 Voyager time period in that setting. Seeing so much more diversity on the crew is something that I really enjoy because it's what you know reality would really be like at this point in the Federation, but we didn't get to see it so much on the TV series, on the live action series, because for budgetary reasons, they couldn't do that. Makeup is much cheaper in animation than it is in live action. (laughs) <laughs> well, so they say, but, you know, have you ever dealt with the animated guild? Oh, boy. You no, think it's, just it's because honest. they're not flesh and blood that they don't need their own latinum, Larry, but. Oh, they're on. Yeah. When they have forced calls and the guild and the overtime kicks in. No, I, um, I'm just thinking how much more diverse this crew is having a whole crew of all kinds and colors and ridges of bipedal two meter tall <laughs> humanoids. That's true. We don't, but, but we do know that there is a cetacean and- ops and I'm pretty sure at some point we're going to go to cetacean ops and we're going to meet commander flipper finally. Well, did you catch it? There was a line where they're there, where, um, uh, when Barb and Beck are ragging on Boimler, Bradward, and he's out and she, and she's, and they're, and you're that, that classic comedy thing of, Coming in on the punchline where they don't have to come up with the actual joke. You know, it's oh, just right, you yeah. hear the punchline. And when she's telling, when Barb is telling stories on Boy Moon, they're both bonding and laughing. Yeah. And she says, and Squill says, no, that's my dorsal. <laughs> and I, th- it hit me. I'm like, 
Is that one of the famous star? Could that have been one of the famous members of Starfleet Cetacean Ops? Did we did we just get? I mean, I, that's one of the things I want to ask Mike now. It's like, and and you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna admit something to you right here, Chris. I have not watched all 46 different versions of different people's podcasts on Easter eggs and analyses, <laughs> uh, partly to keep fresh for Nor this. Have I. Yeah. But uh, but that's not I'm not I'm you know we had a lot of good folks doing a lot of shows out there. It's just kind of a boom. People were so hungry in the fallow years. Now it's like yeah. oh an explosion of shows. I'll do a show too. Well, and good on everybody. Good on. Yeah. But I I haven't. So my point here is I haven't heard if anybody picked up on that. And it was just in this last episode. If anybody's picked up yeah. on that and wondered. Oh, but on sure my they second, probably have. Yeah. On my second watch, I heard dorsal yeah. and I was like, hmm, I wonder because we've got Cetacean Ops on Cerritos. Yeah. 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 I mean, talking about all the shows people are doing with all the Easter eggs, I think it, it just shows how hungry people have been for a return to this setting, this mm-hmm. 24th century visual setting, as well as references to the original series that are completely accurate in terms of the timeline of what we saw Mm -hmm. on television. Yeah, people were very hungry for that, no doubt. But Andorians is one thing I noticed how many Andorians we see Mm -hmm. in this series. And for years, we wanted Andorians and we never got them and we never got them. And then when Enterprise did them, it was like, oh my God, they're going to do Andorians. And they did such a great job with them. But here, it's as a founding member of the Federation, you would expect there to be a lot more Andorians and a lot more Tellarites in addition to Vulcans and humans on the starships, right? And here, we are finally seeing a lot of Andorians. Yeah, I feel like we've seen at least three or four different. I mean, this is now you're back into taking mm-hmm. notes and doing screen grabs. And of course, Memory Alpha is out there you know, doing that. There's a couple I think they've made different that don't need to be different. And and it's it's cool, not just in like the bridge or engineering, like I mentioned, but just when they're in their bar. I love how their bar is just the bar. It doesn't even have a special name like yeah. 10 Forward. <laughs> right. You know why 10 Forward is named 10 Forward, don't you, Chris? Of course, yes. I'm not trying to because insult you. I just thought we could the illuminate front of the ship our, on deck 10. Yeah. It's the front of the deck 10. Right. And it wasn't, you know, yeah. and it's funny because they go, the windows weren't there on the original model. No, it wasn't conceived of until the second season. And, you know, so I love how their bar is just the bar, but there's mess yeah. halls too. And it may be, I got to remember now, maybe it was the Vancouver, but somebody said, I'll see you in mess or something. I may have been on the mm-hmm. Vancouver, but yeah, they have a bar and the people are just sitting there eating. But I love how they populate that. That's another place to people watch and extras watch and background watch, people at the booth. And I love how you get that when someone's – and it, different lead characters and guest characters. Sometimes it's the insanity of a moment. And I don't just mean the, the zombie – the viral zombie attack. I mean other times too. The craziness of the moment or it's just what very calmly comes out of somebody's mouth. But they let those side – like they'll draw – one car- one somebody sitting next chair over, next bar stool over, the next mm-hmm. booth, and they've got like half a face drawn and somebody will- – and of course, your attention is on the talking person. But if you get off that, the other character many times is – unlike they would do the live action extras who had to like just yeah. gromish and greeble in their own little quiet way. Very right. rarely did they ever let direct them to re- – if somebody there's a huge fight going on, then yeah. But most of the time, everybody's like in their little bubble. But all the time on Lower Decks, people are sitting there and all of a sudden they just take the big circular eye and they draw the pupil like, uh-huh. <laughs> the head doesn't turn. <laughs> just the eye goes over, you know, like, hmm? <laughs> Yeah, when the when the when the lead character speaking character says something outrageous, and it's 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 great. It's a wonderful little comedy animation thing, and it's like you're getting all this mileage out of you know, like you're not having to pay anybody to say it. It's it's, it's no big deal for an animator to do it. It could have even been done on the spur of the moment, left up to the visual team, you know, not the script writing team. But right, it's one right. of those things that totally totally makes and it's something that like the third or the fourth or the 19th time you're watching you can pick up and see like what yeah exactly a, wait, yeah. That, you know i will say the rewatch value of these episodes is very high mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because as i said when we started the discussion i've watched them probably at least six times each if not more and i'm still noticing you new see stuff some, all yes. the time yep. yeah and and not just references, but visual things, like very small visual things. And it's not that you're that slow, Chris. <laughs> not that slow. I mean, I'm you know, I don't think I could manage to to serve on the Vancouver, but 
Yeah, you well, know, that's a too, parliament class too bad. show. <laughs> the, yeah, I was the first thing, one of the first things that struck me watching the first couple of episodes was I, I said this a couple of times, maybe that all the rooms are squares. There's no circular court. They do have a big saucer section, but nobody's ever in a round. Well, I guess a couple of times you see a round corridor, but the um, mm-hmm. the spokes of the their their weirdly little bunk corridor situation has there's at least a, a T, you know, the big window at the end. Is that like a square mm. T or is that, are we just seeing a, a really broad arc out there and, and, and their, their corridor is a towel guy's corridor to pace up and down is a spoke in the wheel. <laughs> I don't know. It just seems like most of the rooms are all squares. I'm like, where are you holding the rooms that are arcs? Where are you, where are those happening? Mm. That and the fact that the warp core seems way too huge. It's like the D's warp core was, you know, main area of, wasn't that big and that was a galaxy class and this thing is like half of the ship is in engineering it's just kind of that's a that's why it's boimler's favorite place larry uh-huh it's it's impressive well you know he goes for size what can i say i little things so here's the little thing so all obviously we figured out now that the cerritos well we it's been said the cerritos is a california class right and the team ship there with durango ship is the merced which is another california city okay 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 and all the shuttle crafts are named for national parks in california yeah. okay that's cute so you're on the vancouver and they they're taking the time to draw the names of a couple of shuttles and um you see fairview which is kind of blandly you know, that sounds like any little small town in America or Canada. Anywhere. It could be uh-huh. like Springfield, only it's Fairview. And the next right. one you see is Marpole. And I'm like, okay, that's it. I'm going to look these up. And they're all areas of Vancouver. They're all like neighborhoods of Vancouver. <laughs> so I'm like, like okay. Suburbs. Or, suburbs, okay. yeah. Or just like big neighborhoods. So it's like, okay. So everybody, when you get to name a ship, <laughs> you get to... And it's named for a city. You get to name yeah. it after the. It's just. It's just kind of a funky, funky thing. They're obviously you know, like putting a little, putting a little bit of fun to it. But the last, the more it's gone on. Here's another thing. The more these episodes have gone on, there's been some zany lines in all of them. Like go back to the pilot, second contact, and there's a. It's such a great homage when she's. You know, it's it's not exactly get that cheese to sick bay, but when she says oh, protect right. that slime, and. Yeah. And that was a standout moment. And then there have been funny, funky, goofball, just standalone lines you love to say. You hope they, they turn up on, you know, memes and buttons and stickers and whatever. But this, the last one, I, and some of it, even though they've got the not dominant plot, Ron Emanuel Docent, who, but he's the chief engineer. <laughs> Where they came up with Ron Emanuel Docent for Ron? Hi, I'm Ron Docent. It sounds like he's an infomercial host or something, which I guess may be part of the point. But don't kick my pad. I mean, some of the lines that came out of just that, you know, or when they're fighting, that's exactly what a parasite would say, parasite. I mean, it's, it feels like they're getting really, really good at coming up with these throwaway lines and the lines that are yeah. just thrown out there, including the one that where she's talking about her little time travel thing, how she saved the day. Oh, I just reverse polarities, which itself is a Trek slash Doctor Who meme, right? Oh, I just... yeah. Reverse the polarities and reset, the, and then makes the twenty Chicago joke, blah blah blah. You know, kill the guy that was worse than Hitler. It's a throwaway, right. and you just want to go, yeah, wait, and not twenty Chicago, something else, and you just go, what? I wonder what they were referring to there. It's just, just you know, uh, it just hangs out there yeah. for anybody that wants to stop and think yeah. about it. So it's, I love the parasite. That really made me laugh when they got the parasite out of Boimler's head and they put it in the jar. And then the parasite's like, lover, 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 lover. <laughs> that I laugh every time. It's so funny because the idea of a parasite getting into a Starfleet officer, making them do something unusual. That's a great Star Trek trope. It happens all the time. Yes. But for, but for it to be a goofy little guy that yells lover and that's causing Boimler to say, it's been a long time since I've taken a lover. 
I'm going to stay here and make love to my lover. And Mariner's like, stop saying lover. And then at the end, you find out it's not Boimler. It's this little green guy. Right. right. And she picked up the husk. I don't know. When they were when she got him in the jar and carried him off, I, sw- I wanted him to break out into, hello, my baby. Hello, my honey. Hello, my yeah, ragtime right. girl. Yeah. Yeah. Michigan yeah, yeah, J. Yeah. Frog. And uh, yeah. Yeah. It didn't quite go there. That's what he that reminded was... me of, actually. Yeah. Michigan J. Frog. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. See, great yeah. minds. Yay. Uh, who was not named that in the cartoon, I should say. I can't, somebody's going to know the name of the animation. But it, that was like one of those retro, that was one of those things retconned, you know. Yeah. Like the name of the uh, little pet in the Insurrection. No, I mean, I, I. it's only been five episodes in a 10 episode season, but I, and I know they had a plan, mm-hmm. you know, a big picture way. And like we said, these are building up to two or three climactic kind of episodes at the end. And maybe some of these things we're wishing for, like break up the couples and let them cross. You know, and some yeah. of the other characters we haven't seen much of, but you can definitely tell that they're they're settling in. And I here's a big picture mm-hmm. question for you, Chris. Mm-hmm. I see just watching, and I've been a little distracted lately, but just watching fandom go by <laughs> out on the inner tubes, mm-hmm. uh, Facebook mostly, but also Twitter. Do you get the sense that a lot of fan, a lot, of, and a lot of people were like, oh. I'm worried about comedy and I'm worried about animation and don't, mm-hmm. you know, and this is not the original, the original series anime, the TAS was just trying to bring original series into animation. You know, every mm-hmm. episode wasn't Kirk is a jerk on the, <laughs> every episode wasn't practical joke, et cetera, et cetera. But you get the feeling like this show has not only entertained the people that were looking forward to it, but it's pleasantly surprised a lot of, I won't say naysayers, but I'll say skeptical fans. And that people are being won over and we're five episodes in. And may I even mm-hmm. say people might be in and even people who are, are open. I'm not talking about, you know, our our 10 percent loud fans or whatever or the amplified mm-hmm. by 20 and another another 10 percent of, of trolls. But you get the idea that maybe more people are genuinely organically having fun with this than Picard and Discovery. Or especially Discovery. Yeah. I'm just getting a well, sense that a lot yeah, of fandom is feeling like, I think so. oh, my God, I'm enjoying this and it's having fun and it's better than I thought it would be. And I'm enjoying this. And I feel like – and like you said, I, I want to sit down and watch this three or four or five times. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think there are reasons for that. And I'm one of those people mm-hmm. who was skeptical about it. I was I not it. bothered that they were making it. But I wasn't sure how that comedy Mm -hmm. element was going to play out. But I'm enjoying it quite a lot. Otherwise, I wouldn't rewatch the episodes over and over. Even though I need to talk about them, I could just watch them twice and then talk about it. But Mm -hmm. I keep watching them over and over because I'm seeing so much stuff in there that I enjoy. And I think there are reasons why maybe more people are being won over by it than we expected. The biggest reason is that I think that even though Picard has been nice because we got Jean-Luc back and mm-hmm. we got to see Troy and we got to see Riker and Data and, and that storyline and, yes. and Seven, of course, and Hugh and Elnor didn't get to see a cat, but we've seen one. So uh, <laughs> anyway, and we saw the Borg and we saw these familiar mm-hmm. elements that was, and that storyline was a bit more seated in, like, settled into Star Trek lore compared with Discovery, where they're mm-hmm. doing their own new thing. Kind of skated along the top. Yeah. yeah. So that's been nice, but it still was not a return to the Star Trek that we had watched for so many years, that style of storytelling and that aesthetic environment. And people really want to return to that. So I think they're willing to give Lower Decks a chance, especially as they hear people talking positively about it. And once you get into it, it feels comfortable. And the humor, like I said at the beginning, sometimes the references are a bit too frantic for me. They're mm-hmm. they're, they're like dumping stuff a little too often. Yeah, mm-hmm. here and there. But uh, as the episodes have gone on, I feel like they've settled down quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The first episode is just 
a grab bag of like, let's just throw everything we possibly can. And then you get to the end. It's a 26 minute episode and you get to the end. And in case we didn't throw enough stuff at you already. Right, right. Mariner is going to drag Boimler out and she's just going to do like a massive dump of every <laughs> reference she can possibly think of to end the episode. Just name but eight or ten after- regular recurring characters you can. Right. Yeah. Across Have all you ever heard of Colin? Hey, you should call Troy. It's just it was just too much, <laughs> in my opinion. But they've settled down quite a bit, and now there are those moments. But what I'm seeing, and I, I wanted to mention this earlier when we were talking about the characters, is that I feel like five episodes in. It's too soon to really have real mm-hmm. character development. Any TV show after five episodes, you're not going to develop your characters that much. It's been but a you whole can half already, season, Chris. It's been half a season. <laughs> but you can see the the trend already where we are getting character mm-hmm. development. We are getting to know these characters, especially Boimler, especially Mariner and Tendi. As you said earlier, Rutherford, mm-hmm. we don't know as much about yet. And of course, the bridge crew, we're not knowing as much about yet. But well, some more than others, but still, yeah. But they're doing a pretty good job, I think, after only five episodes of starting mm-hmm. to give us stories where we get to know the characters a little bit more on a personal level. It's not just that we have these characters that are going on this mission to this planet to do a second contact or to, you know, break out of mm-hmm. a prison or whatever they're going to do. Tank the, take the, the drunk Klingon. Klingon general down to the planet or whatever. <laughs> Bring yeah. me my drinking horn. <laughs> I need a drink. <laughs> I love it when they they finally find him. They they finally find the shuttle at the end. They wipe the tickets off the window. They open it and Boimler's like, he drank everything. <laughs> that kind of line. That's what really makes me laugh. But... Anyway, back to what I'm saying. Well, here, and the then how the how the Starfleet how the Starfleet officer that receives him is kind of like, oh, it's him again. It's like, oh, he was drinking. He was on a bender. It's like they're <laughs> like, yeah, right. big deal. <laughs> we know we know this guy, but yeah, I feel like we're already getting character centric stories where we're starting to know the characters a bit, mm-hmm. and so I can see how. The series, they're doing what I hoped they were going to do, which is that they're ramping down the frantic nature of the comedy a bit, Mm -hmm. and they're focusing on the characters a bit more, and it's starting to feel like a character-driven show, not Mm -hmm. a humor-driven show. Not a joke-driven show, yeah. It's It's not a show that's driven entirely on making references to past Star Trek. Right, right. It's they're they're it's, settling into where that's not its whole. It's not a crutch, which that's yeah. what I was concerned about a bit going in, mm-hmm. and it's also what I was concerned about a bit after Second Contact that it was just going to be a crutch, and you can only make those references for so long before it gets old, mm-hmm. and. I was going to say before you run out of material, I know we've got like 54 years of material, but nevertheless, you can still only make so many references before you start repeating things and it gets old. So that can't be what the show is about. And so far, my take on the show is that they're, they used that to set it up to get everyone hooked. But now they're giving us humor that's based on the broader tropes, as we talked about earlier, not specific mm-hmm. references to episodes or specific uh, characters and things that happened. And we're getting to know these characters a bit more. And the characters are likable. Like, Tindy is a very likable character. Rutherford is a nice character, which, again, we don't know much about yet. And Mariner, eh, she's a bit much for me. But I actually think that her being a bit over the top countered with Boimler's character. Mm-hmm. When you put the two of them together, it's a really nice balance. I thought that yesterday they when I was watching They can both be again. over the top to get not. <laughs> <laughs> but they balance each other out quite well. And that part of the show works really well for me. And I think that fans who like the character-driven nature of Star Trek, and this is, you know, Matthew and I always say this about mm-hmm. Deep Space Nine, People who don't know Deep Space Nine very well think, oh, it's that dark show and they've got the war. But of all the Star Trek series, 
it's mm-hmm. more driven by its characters and their relationships to each other mm-hmm. and what the situations they find themselves in, how those situations impact them as individuals more so than any of the other series. And so that's important. And if you like that character nature of Star Trek, I can see Lower Decks heading in that direction already. So it gives me optimism for the series. And I think it's why maybe, as you were asking originally, it's being better received by Mm -hmm. a a broader fan base than maybe we expected going in. The other thing that's about DS9 is, yeah, it's the darker, grittier show and all that. And you think that's the last one to have humor. What's amazing in DS9 is when there is actual humor and it's not always humor. Yeah, it's very funny, but a lot of times it's very yeah. dry and it's very yeah. – it's organic in the moment. And yet sometimes there is a little, you know, um, the lions and tigers and bear bit and war, what's it good for? Absolutely mm-hmm. nothing. There's some really dry stuff that if you're not paying attention, it'll go right past you. And you go like, wait, yeah. did they yeah. really do that? And it's all straight-faced. And there's that yeah. kind of referential, yeah. you know, humor in it too that they're getting away with at times. Totally Ira being on the sly there and whoever, you know, he well, let do it. DS9 has more references to the original series in it than mm-hmm. any other Star Trek. And, you know, now we're getting, a, we're getting a lot of those same kinds of references in Lower Decks. It's just mm-hmm. DS9 that did them in a more subtle way, dropping them but in I, here and but, there and wasn't played for humor necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, there's, there's, you know, next gen and Voyager would be kind of, huh, huh, kind of, hu- not, not mm-hmm. fall down guffaw humor, but it would be, oh, I'll tease him. Oh, I'll play a trick on Worf. Oh, I'll play a trick on Harry, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. And, and that didn't happen so much with DS9, but there would be organic moments that arose. There would be some absurdist moments on DS9. Yeah. Where there wasn't a lot of the same kind of build up to have absurdity. And on Next Gen, maybe it happened with Worf was an easy target or, or Picard's <laughs> stuff shirtedness, you know, like spill, Sonia Gomez spilling the coffee. And even then, right, that was so right. early. They didn't really, they, that'd been five years later. It would have been a little better. But anyway, my point here is you find comedy in odd moments and you, it's not just a thing in a box and you get it out there's all kinds and and people were worried about that with with this show yeah i think yes that that was a worry in some cases but i feel like it's playing out quite well mm-hmm. and i know we're halfway through the first season larry but if you think about any <laughs> past star trek series well first of all we know they all they don't get good till the third season <laughs> That's well, the thing all those, says. all these measurements, these metrics, it's yeah. like halfway through a season was typically 13 shows <laughs> and that would be 13 right. hours, not yeah. two and a half hours, you know? Yeah. So we're only like midway through the third episode of a... <laughs> <laughs> that, exactly. And and that's my point yeah. that, you know, after five episodes where it's like 26, 24, 24, 24, 25, I think I, I checked them earlier when I was watching and to see how consistent they were mm-hmm. because... In Discovery and Picard, we've had like great fluctuations in the the length of right. episodes. Whereas, ten minutes, fifteen the, minutes, even yeah, the TNG era, they usually came in like within ten or fifteen seconds of each other. Well, they right? had to. Maybe they were minute, commercial networks, you know. right? They had to fit right. with everything they else. Had to, yeah, yeah. yeah. But and so they had to, and so we're getting that a little bit here, which. Uh, Given that this doesn't have to have commercials, I don't know if even that might be a bit of an homage to the past. Like, let's come in, like, right at the timestamp. So, we've talked about bits and pieces of the various episodes. Running through them one by one, are there any particular standout moments or any particular things you want to point out about each one? So, in Second Contact, one thing that came to mind for me is how over the top they played the the classic plot of the crew being infected with some kind mm-hmm. of disease. Mm-hmm. When finally the bite that Ransom had gotten, when it finally overtakes him when they're in the bar and he turns into the zombie and the black mm-hmm. blood or fluid mm-hmm. or whatever it is is spewing out. And then the firefight starts. And from that point forward, everything that's happening on the ship with the crew being turned into zombies and how kind of over the top grotesque it was. But weapon handling zombies. Yes. 
Right. To me, it was very funny because it was taking that that Mm -hmm. plot that we've seen many times in Star Trek and just exaggerating the hell out of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, I thought, was well done and appropriate and probably a good starting point to kind of get us into how they were going to exaggerate Star Trek humor. Again, climaxing with the Star Trek moment had nothing to do with the lower deckers. The start, like I said, the exaggerated drama between the captain mm-hmm. and the chief medical officer. Well, you'd better hope you don't have much time. <laughs> yeah, right. She's looking yeah, at the thing exactly. under. It's it's like all the token <laughs> drama lines and 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 Mariners in the back going, "Did you wash your hands? Stole it, Mar-, you know." And then yeah. and then yeah, and, and but that that's the kind of uh, trope that happens all the way through. They're making. There's, a, I love the bit here. It, it, uh, I guess it was Cupid's Air and Arrow where, where Beckett's trying to get herself up to the platform and she's on the, on the comm system with somebody and she goes, uh, 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 emergency beam out to platform station, uh, security code Mariner 8. And the guy on the voice goes, right. and she goes, uh, Mariner 8. And the guy goes, you, that's not a real code. You just made that up. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Which is dying. <laughs> it was another like Star Trek trope. Like they always have a code ready. Yeah, you know, it's they like always there's always something yeah. to do. Like you know, it's I like want to see uh, Janeway code lambda nine two seven four six alpha. <laughs> right. You know, I, I want to see the 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 moments where they're sitting in their room with the computer and they're just programming all those codes in. Like, do they have a spreadsheet? Do they have like a random security code generator app? On their pad, That's, do they have like one password in space? What do they, what do they use for this? We, well, his password was Riker. That was hysterical too. Oh, that, um, yeah, this funny. <laughs> his is really simple. It's like everyone's password is complicated except for his. His password is Riker. Uh, yeah. Yes, it was projection. You know, inverse projection or something. <laughs> now, the, so here's a, here's a um, here's the thing. Now this is what made you uncomfortable and me too a little bit. You were you were ragging about her. Her saying, you know, like, well, come on, guys, Spears, what is this, Kirk? What is the 2260s? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we see that with, you know, there's references to Picard and Data and Riker as a password and all of that up and down the line and Spock. And aside from the spew at the end of the first season, they pop up. What I want to hear is, as the show goes along and becomes mature, I want to hear her do that, but with characters we've never heard of. But save them. Oh, uh, yeah. To where everybody she's talking to, it's either like she's venting her frustration with the Kirk uh-huh. line, which is funny. Yeah. But there's other times when people throw things out at each other because it's it's a everyone knows who she's talking about or who whoever the character speaking. Everybody knows. Uh-huh. Well, it's Kirk. Well, it's Spock. Well, it's Picard. Hey guys, did you, you know, the the throwback scene with the gray tops? Hey guys, did you hear? They just found out Data has a evil twin, and turns out he's in contact with the Borg. <laughs> it's like those guys have something new happen every week, which was an awesome line. <laughs> mm-hmm. That was great. But the fact that she's sitting there talking on this middling ship docked at DS9. Hey, did you hear the data? I mean, it's like first name basis with all these guys and gals. Mm-hmm. What I want to hear now is I want to hear some of that kind of thing after they've got it all established. I want to hear like heroes. I want to hear names thrown out that were probably from a time between Kirk and Picard's time. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like the original series would do that thing where they would say, look at him. Our history has been full of these types. Caesar, Genghis Khan, Hitler, Lee Kwan, Colonel Green, you know, and they would do that thing where you knew what the context was and they would name drop real history and then throw in a couple more. And you were like, "Ooh, that's the guy last year and the guy a hundred years before Kirk, but after us. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, you would get that feeling. Well, I want to, I want to have some of those, even in a funny moment, it would be great to have. Just a throwaway line, and maybe there's some kind of reference, because I know it has to have some context. Kirk and Picard and Data have context, because we're all viewers, and we all know the Star Trek mythos. I think it would be fun if the show can get mature enough to throw one or two or three of them. And they've kind of done it a little bit. They do it with species. They'll say, yeah. uh, what, like, oh, it's a Lorian uh, egg sack. <laughs> and your mind is left to think, what was he touching and shaking a hand? He thought it was a hand. And oh, my <laughs> goodness. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, it's like in Star Trek Six. Oh, that's where he keeps his, that's his, gen- his knee is his genitals. Like, yeah, what? not everyone keeps their genitals in the same place, Captain. Yes. Yeah. 
that kind of thing, only aside from just like species in anatomy, maybe famous other Starfleet heroes or maybe other Starfleet bozos, you know. But it would be fun to have that thrown in. And then maybe every third or fourth or fifth episode, we make a... They could totally build up whole biographies of people. And this is canon. They could come up with a whole, you know, running... The way DS9 would talk about Captain Baudet, you know, as that we never oh, saw right. him. But you had the whole... Just make up a thing every fourth or fifth episode of some historical person or contemporary of theirs. Or maybe like 20 years back. Or maybe yeah. 10 years before the D, you know, something like that and be recurring on three or four different things. And it would be a lot of fun. And then it wouldn't have to be always a reference to Kirk or Picard or Spock or whatever that we know. And after yeah. a while, it can be totally, so it could be even better than Towel Guy that we visually see. <laughs> but it could be a running, it could be a build up. I hadn't thought about this until it's coming out of my mouth as we speak. Chris, but you know I what I'm just, saying? Uh, it's like take advantage yeah. of it being in this window of time and not concerned with something so overarchingly dramatic as Discovery and Picard and just have fun with yeah. it. Do that the same way DS9's got Ira and the boys used to throw in Tholians and Tellarites and Andorians, you know, right. and Gorn at a time when they weren't allowed to do them. But you could still mention them and keep them alive that way. Well, this is kind of that only slightly different. I just had a, a visual, Larry. Because I saw the other day that Jason Isaac had mentioned that maybe they could find a way to have Lorca on Strange New World. Mm -hmm. So if we have these kind of crossover things, I'm just picturing like... Prime Lorca. Uh, prime Lorca, right. I'm picturing a live action series. Maybe it's season two Picard for the time period setting to be a little bit closer. Mm -hmm. Live action towel guy walks in. That's the kind of crossover we're going to have from <laughs> But it's, oh no, it's like it's not the same one, Chris. It's just like you know, <laughs> every ship has one. <laughs> I was going to say it should be the same one because that would be funny. But actually, it's funnier if every ship has a guy that just roams the corridors in a towel. But it's got to be lower. It's got like a dorm. It's like it's not anybody that's good enough to like lieutenants get you know personal quarters or whatever. No, it's got to be where right. the ensigns and the the enlisted right, exactly. crew are. Yeah, it's not going to be up are. in the saucer, you know, near the bridge or anything. It's going to be down in the lower decks, of course. But and my God, if the ensigns are getting those bunks, where are the noncoms? Someday we need to go down to where <laughs> the noncoms are. Like, what are they doing? There's they have probably, like a big. There were four they, in the bed, have, and the little one said, roll over, roll over. They all rolled over and went. Oh, by the way, the the visual <laughs> that makes me laugh every time, speaking of they all rolled, is when, is when she is bored out of her gourd when Mariner is – and she's laying in her bed, and, and the announcements come in, and finally she just makes like a roll. And she doesn't oh, she just roll out off. of her bed. She rolls yeah. in an arc and rolls out of frame, <laughs> like a 45-degree <laughs> right. arc. <laughs> Exactly. I laugh every time at that, even though it's... Yeah. Larry, as for the, the non-coms, on a ship like this, they have a number of cargo bays that aren't used just in case they mm -hmm. need to transport things. Right. The non-coms, they all have sleeping bags in the cargo bay. Oh, okay. They're just sleeping in there. Yeah, they, they don't even have their own space at all. It's like a ship crisis episode, only it's every yeah. day. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's their that's their experience. So just going back to what you were saying, though, just to be sure I understand uh, and listeners understand, you're saying to create a mythos around these characters who we've never heard of before. So these are characters, not obscure characters that are rarely mentioned, but no, actually create people. Yeah. Yeah. Who, Captain this and commander that and ambassador this and potentate Poobah of, yes. And then you fill in the history and it becomes a recurring thing. Yeah. And it also gives people on Memory Alpha new pages to write about these characters because that have never that's appeared what they before. Need. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Just make it the equivalent of, and you know, not every episode, but just throw it in there to make everybody do what I was doing. Like, wait, it was that General Order 2. Was that ever actually given any? Let's go check. Oh, oh, cool. They're using the cannon. Hey, wait a minute. They just came up with that. How dare they? Oh, that's right. They're making new. There's no law that says new shows can't keep. <laughs> you don't have to keep regurgitating, you know. Right. Oh, that's what we yeah. call, hmm, yeah, that's doing fan service for the fanboys. Or, or you know, it's like, no, it's called Use the Universe, and you can do <laughs> new stuff, too. But in their case, it's it's like tweaking it, 
you know, like we're laughing about what is this? Spears, Kirk, the toy to just come up yeah. with, just come up with something and then keep it going. It's kind of, you know, have it be the personal equivalent of Parisi squares. It's like we've had 47 million references to Parisi squares and never we saw people in the uniforms for Parisi squares and never once saw the game actually ever played, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> So it's like it just – it'll almost ruin Parisi Squares if you ever actually see it if in a match. If you ever find out what it really is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They should have a contest like in, in the future when it's possible for people to get together in the same location once again for a convention. They should have at Star Trek Las Vegas a contest where you come up with your own Parisi Squares. Like this is what you think the game is. And and you put it on, and attendees can play it, and there's some kind of prize at the end, maybe a trip to sick bay or something. I'm shocked that that hasn't happened, and maybe it even actually has, and maybe one of our listeners can let us know, or we can uh, you know, maybe. go Google it. But um, I'm almost I would be shocked if somebody at least had, like in the old days, <laughs> in the old days when people were trying to come up with rules for tridimensional chess. And kind of, sort of, out of all the fan creativity, there was kind of a rule, a game that came up. And then when Franklin Min or whoever did a set in the 90s, they put out those rules. You know, they couldn't copyright mm. them, but they just kind of said, okay, fair use, we'll just use this. And it's one of those cases where there were never rules, you know, when they would use the bits of dialogue, actually, you know. Queen to Queen's Bishop Seven or whatever it was, yeah, uh, wasn't yeah. even from a real game. But you, the whole way of the the movable attack boards and then the tech. Anyway, something the equivalent to that uh, for Parisi Squares. How we got to Parisi Squares, I don't know. But that's what I'm saying is, we, <laughs> how do we, we get anywhere, Larry? Some, uh, yeah. 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 Often our conversations are like the Enterprise hopping into a unstable wormhole in the motion picture. We're just in here, and somehow we find our way out. Do we? <laughs> dun, dun, sometimes. Dun. sometimes sometimes so so se anyway second contact was i told you uh, this was going to be boring introduction Chris. i was looking forward to the show <laughs> it's everything i thought it would be and more i am so happy with 99 percent of it ta-da that'll really set the world on fire that'll really <laughs> that'll really kick yeah. off a kickstarter campaign yeah uh-huh so second <laughs> contact was of course overflowing and you even had references mm -hmm. to First contact with walking on the hull in the you know, oh, yeah. gravity boots and the spacesuits, and it was kind of over the top. Then things settled down a bit. Uh, we got Envoys, uh -huh. and Envoys I thought was a, a really fun episode, and having the Klingon come in <laughs> was fun. <laughs> Going down to the planet, like meeting the Klingon who served him a warrior's meal. Mm hmm. That that whole setting reminded me of the end of Discovery season one. I think when we go down to the, the Orion district mm -hmm. and then we mm -hmm. it had that kind of feeling to it with the booths and everything. That that was kind of interesting. And then Well and Envoys, Envoys also the Envoys had the whole thing with the Andorians in the bar and the Vendorian and all of that just being thrown in. And, and like, oh, cool. And the, yeah. And the Lurian, the, who you see for just a moment. I thought that was mm -hmm. so funny that they're in a bar setting and the fight starts. And just for a second, you see a Lurian there. So you think mm -hmm. about Morn hanging out in Cork's bar all the time. Is this a thing like Lurians? They just find bars and hang out right. there. Right. <laughs> That's what they do. It's not a stereotype. It's a species requirement. Yes. And my, but my, my favorite thing Probably my favorite thing in Envoys is when they need to get back to the shuttlecraft and then the Ferengi jumps out from behind the tree. <laughs> and, you know, it's like a Brothers Grimm fairy tale. It's like, ooh, mm -hmm. follow me, little girl, <laughs> little boy. You know, I have goodies in the cave. Uh -huh. <laughs> like that. But, but then, then Mariner's like, I think it's a Bolian, right? After she's talked so much about how she's seen stuff and she knows everything. And Boimler's telling her, he's obviously a Ferengi. He's doing the little hand thing that yeah, they he's do. He's doing the token Ferengi thing, yeah. The, the, the whole sequence was, was really funny. But then when you get to the end and you find out that she's but just trying to that. make Boimler feel better. Yeah, you knew something was going on. 
But well, I mean, I've read the, fans that like had no clue, and I'm like, oh come on, yes, like what you just said. Of yeah, course she knew you that knew was that, a Ferengi, but she has yeah, a blind spot. Of course spot for she Ferengi? knew it was a Ferengi, right? Yeah. W- but what what you didn't know, or I didn't think about until the very end, is that she it was like a friend of hers, and she had somehow. Mm-hmm when we were watching something else, made all these arrangements for him to jump out. Right. And that, that was a nice little moment, but it also shows that like she presents herself as this, I don't care about anything exactly. and a badass, exactly. but she obviously cares about Boimler and she felt bad that he was feeling bad. And she went an extra mile parsec, whatever we want to call Kilometer, it. Yeah. Whatever. You know, to, to make him feel better. And that was a great character moment. Well, that was the f- that really was the first stab. Yeah. That and her sympathetic reaction to him being all broken down. The whole the whole mm-hmm. sequence with they're going to find me with a shaky video. Final log yeah. entry. Yeah. But yeah, that was the first time when you got a you got a sense of. It's almost like the McCoy Spock moment in the turbo lift during a muck time when he says, and I also request McCoy. And he says, I am honored, sir. So all the bickering and bantering that had built up yeah. as the first season yeah. went along and they kick off the second season with that moment. And you go, aha, uh-huh. it's not that they hate each other, you know, or, or an Odo Quark thing where they, yeah, you know, where you have the band, you know, and it, it, Odo Quark was way worse than Spock McCoy ever were, but. You have that time, too. But, yes, that was the first time, which has done nothing but grow across the – my favorite thing was – yeah, I knew – I knew knew she – because you're like, okay, what's it going to be with Of course she knows it's a Ferengi. Of course she knows it's a Ferengi. And then even in the bar back on the ship, and he's going on and going on, and she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And she's just letting him go This better be some hell of a payoff. And to me, the payoff was was the Ferengi with a monocle. (laughs) With a monocle. That was so funny. (laughs) Where did she's like how's the who in the the wife wears a monocle it's like he was uh he was uh, he was like a little uh he was like a bird that saw the saw the shiny monocle picked it up and flew it back to his and he's a and he's a ferengi not to be you know specious or anything but it's like i could just see him finding that monocle somewhere and totally where it's the 21st century he could have his eyes fixed if he needed to but he's totally wearing it for effect I think Even that's when his he's theme, just on the calm you know? to a viewer to a person yeah. he knows. It's kind of hard to stand out in the Ferengi Alliance, Larry. And that was his thing. He's monocle guy. That was his thing. Yes. And yeah. now you figured it out, and now everybody knows it's a fake. And- <laughs> <laughs> but but actually, the fact that she knows him in the same episode where where she knows the Klingon, it, you you start getting mm-hmm. that sense of somehow. She's very well connected. She knows everybody. She she's like Jadzia, right? Except <laughs> she hasn't had seven lifetimes to get to know everybody. Right. And the way she handles but somehow the, she knows. This also throws back to the way she handles uh it's it's a it's weird now to think about it. Her mom walks in to all the purple people and red guy from the mixed mm-hmm. system moons and slams down the table and says, Okay. Okay, we're going to get you guys a pile of dirt to worship. We're going to get you guys, a, you know, this and this. Yeah. And she figures it out. You're going to move the, to moon the, the six, thing about, which will now be moon five. You know? <laughs> this is mixed us moon five. The weird thing about that show was I the second watch, I was like, oh, wait a minute. There was a – right. The captain invited her over. The captain of the Vancouver, the uh, mighty Vancouver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They draw her in some scenes, but the captain – A, we never learned the name of the captain – B, she never talks after the introductory scene. And C, mm-hmm. she just gives it – like about the time you're thinking Freeman is this broken down like manic mom whose daughter is going to ruin her Starfleet career or take her off the tack. Then for some reason, she's there to help them with this. They're there to mechanically, you know, engineeringly help with the moon process. But she gets sucked into a little – you know, Jean-Luc would be proud of her handling there – but mm-hmm. not only that, the captain is like totally in on it. Like what this captain can do everything but negotiate local <laughs> alien squabbles. Like, isn't that like a main Starfleet command? Ca- and she's got a big ship. How did she fail the subtle local squabbles class? Because you never hear her talk after that. You never, you know, it's all Freeman all the time. And Freeman gets the credit for, you know, saving it at the end. And Freeman is the one on her bridge. Freeman is the one that says implode the moon when they find out the, the right. red skin mixed in <laughs> is like, a you know, is a rich windbag. 
And the captain is there, never never opens her mouth again. Well, they, they just redid the carpets, Larry. <laughs> they just redid so, the carpets. Yeah. No, but you know what I'm saying? It struck me on a second rewatch. It's like, wait a minute. They're not on the Cerritos. Yeah. They're on... They're on the Vancouver right. and they're she's the Vancouver, giving the orders yeah. and leading the diplomacy. Like what that other, the other <laughs> captain is just a would be windbag. Anyway, I thought that but, was weird. But, but the that, fact that her uh, mother jumps yeah. in, Freeman jumps in and takes over negotiations is so yeah. like Mariner jumping up on the table in envoys and settling the bar fight. Look, oh, uh, drinks right. for everybody. Yeah. Okay. They're all about to come yeah. to blows and they're like, oh, okay, fine. I love the yeah. way people say the one thing and they're like, oh, okay, fine. You know, it's like nothing like that never happens yeah. in, in real Star Trek. The big fight is <laughs> just somebody goes, come on, we'll all get drunk. Oh, OK. <laughs> come on here. Ding, 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 ding. Here's your little dinky thing you want. Oh, OK. But it is another Star Trek thing where the captain of our ship comes into the situation, mm -hmm. no matter who else is already there from Starfleet. And they're the only one who can fix the problem. Right. They have to carry out the negotiation, right? Yeah, it's like the personal version of it's the only ship in the quadrant. Well, it's the only hero negotiator in the yeah in the sector. Yeah, but my but we get back to here that that by the second episode we are seeing bits of Mariner come through yeah. where she's like intentionally she could be a standout. Oh, the, and then at the end where they're they're uh, moist vessel. And they're fixing mm -hmm. the problem there. And she's at the transporter, at the cargo con uh, transporter, whatever, yeah. fixing the problem and techno spewing, j techno babble, babbling yeah. just with the best of them ever. The best Geordie yeah. data moment ever. And she's she's not only spewing techno babble, she's figuring the problem out while spewing techno right. babble. And that's really where well, you get the sense of we're skipping around, I know, but you're really getting the sense of she's really throttling herself. She's really wrapped up. I know it's a cartoon and comedy yeah, and all yeah. that stuff, but yeah. the road she's been on all this, it's not just street smarts. She's got some book learning in her too. And well, she's yeah, sitting on it. Yeah, that's what I was going to you know. point out is that yeah. uh, building up to that, there's the whole back and forth with her and her mom and she calls her mm -hmm. Carol. <laughs> you did yeah. not just call me Carol. <laughs> Carol! But as they talk more and more, uh, it's another character moment where we're already seeing their relationship come together. We're delving a bit into mm -hmm. maybe why Mariner is the way that she is. We're probably going to find out more about their background. But her mother says, oh, that's exactly what I was going to do. You read my mission brief, <laughs> yes. didn't you? And she's like, yes. no, no. Well, maybe a little bit, y you know, just so I could make fun of it or whatever. Yeah, but, just so I could be ironic. But, <laughs> but the the revealing point of that is that she acts like she doesn't care, but she actually prepares herself mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. the missions that she's going on. So oh, it's just a cartoon, it Chris. Act. Don't take it too seriously. <laughs> uh, at your peril. No, that was a that was a really cool look. The mm -hmm. the comedy is going to be there, and it will be manic, and it'll always be heightened. But some of the organic laughter is going to come out of the situation. And I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's not animated in a wacky way, but I swear to God, when she collapses, when she goes, uh, like the yawning in the beginning is a little mm -hmm. over the top. You're like, oh come on, it's not that bad. But as you watch her, as they as they push her through the Play-Doh fun factory of the of the boredom that she has to put up with with rank, and, yeah. and when they're arguing over the chairs, that was really that was actually kind of funny too, <laughs> and a reference to some of the next generation. Some years the bridge chairs had a leather had a contrast stripe it was a big argument researching right. for the vegas experience even because some of the bridge yeah. chairs in the in the d bridges at the experience had a strip of fabric down the middle and it's like what no there were some in next gen that no it didn't where did that come from anyway that's that's yeah. what that reminded me of which would be a really deep cut but they've come up with that fake meeting agenda of all yeah. the senior officers arguing over chairs and she's just wanting to poke her you know stab herself <laughs> with pain sticks in the eye and then to go home and you're being summoned to an executive coffee or the the, the poker party? Was that like a takeoff? Oh, the on executive the, poker, yeah. Yeah. Was that a takeoff <laughs> on all the glorious next-gen officer parties? Yeah, you're of course boring, it was. You all fold. Because you of folding. Fold. Yeah, you always fold. You always fold. And Dr. Ta'ana has, has yeah. data's green shade, which is another great 
another great <laughs> so, moment there. Oh, yeah. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But the fact that – the point here is the fact that she is out there. So when she does the thing that cracks me up every time, when she – when she turns into a log and rolls off the bed because she's yeah, paralyzed yeah. with boredom. That's why it's right. even funnier. It's not just that it's drawn funny, which it is. It's conceived and visualized really funny. But you totally, you're already wrapped at the moment of her wanting to gouge your eyes out. And in a way, they're being mean to her. It's not, she's not bringing it on herself. She yawned at the beginning. And that's what brought all this on. But the yawning and the whole meeting scene <laughs> was again... Uh A joke about the next generation and all the staff meetings that they have. And I think uh, many of us are very used to it because we just watched the show when it aired. And maybe we we were old enough Mm -hmm. that having a staff meeting where they kind of explain what's going on so the story can advance is fine. But on my other podcast, Interphase, which is a Star Trek Universe podcast, the last episode that I released about a week or so ago, I have my friend and colleague, Michael Pefferon, who is watching the original series for the very first time. Mm, that's right. Star Trek in general for the very first time. He watched that, and that's what we talk about on the show. But now he's almost finished with The Next Generation. And at the beginning, when I asked him, how did you avoid Star Trek all those years growing up in the United States? He mentioned that he was about 12 years old when The Next Generation was on, and Mm. he would see bits and pieces, and he would see these staff (laughs) meetings, and it looked really boring to him. It ain't Star Wars, kids. Yeah. It just was Yeah, and he was a Star Wars fan at the time. Oh, Not a Star Trek fan, and when he would see those clips, he just felt, ah, it just looks so boring. You know, he said, I I feel... Feel like, I felt like I was still at school and the teachers were having a meeting. And so when, when I saw this here on Lower Decks and, and Mariner is yawning and yawning as they have this briefing. And a boring Tellarite captain at the beginning and is a boring giving the briefing. T- uh, yeah. Whoever thought you'd I mean, hear the he, words boring and Tellarite, I'll give them that. I'll give them that well, to make it Tellarite You boring. would think with a name like Durango, he might be exciting, but... Apparently, he's always been boring. But that's just another one of those, to me, funny moments where they're not making specific specific references. They're just making fun of situations. And Mm -hmm. that's what I I thought was quite funny. Uh, Okay, so that's Moist Vessel, Temporal Edict. Anything stand out to you on Temporal Edict? Well, that's the one I think... And not that I'm – I see people every week go, this is my favorite. Nope, nope, number two is too much. This is yeah, – I haven't really had that happen, but I kind of think this might be the – even with – and you know what? Some of the some of the sins we see in, in Second Contact, the pilot, the first episode, I think mm-hmm. are pilot-itis. I think it's pilot make a yeah. splash effect. And right. they're going yeah, yeah, for a little outrageousness to, to just grab people, to make them hang right. on. Especially people who aren't Trek fans. So I will forgive the pilot for a little bit of that if they don't lose people that were expecting more Star Trek and they walk away. Temporal Edict, I think, is maybe the weakest of all of them only because the whole thing about the captain being so manic. That's the, that's the key highlight sitcom-y moment too far, Mm -hmm. I think, of the first five is where she's, wrapped up in this mania about making everybody do this and it goes on and on and on and on and it's and it's to the it is to the absurd and yes I know it's a cartoon and it's heightened humor but it's absurdism absurdism and then on top of that it takes the lowly ensign to come in and convince you know everybody on the bridge has passed out from spasms or whatever it is yeah. And he's the one that comes in and saves the day. And then she's, oh, my God, you're right. You've made me see with fresh eyes. And, yes, I know it's a cartoon. But that's the one that seems the most out of sync or pu- I don't know how you feel, but the one that pushes the off. There's still funny moments in it. And that's not the main, you know, there's the other the, the other arc, too. Yeah. But that's the one that I think is the is the weakest of all the five. And it's for that reason, I think, even though there's some great, still great moments in it. For me, the... Set up the the idea that buffer time, which we've always heard, mm-hmm. you know, goes back to Scotty multiplying right. everything by a factor of four, right? 
we get so used to it watching Star Trek that we don't think about it anymore. I guess I guess Scotty people... messed up by not filing a trademark because so many other things are known <laughs> by their name. You know, Kirk Fu and Kirk Fists and you know. All oh that. right. Scotty didn't tra- time. now. It's just oh, it's just it's just buffer time. It's like how did he lose his patent on that? <laughs> how did he lose his trademark? But constantly in Star Trek, people are being asked how long is it going to take especially the engineers, mm-hmm. are being asked, how long is it going to take to get this up and running or do this or do that? That's because you've got the ticking clock toward death. <laughs> right. Well, we, we've gotten so used to the answers and we've gotten so used to the idea of, well, with Scotty padding time and then there's that moment in Relics where mm-hmm. Scotty says, how long will it really take? And Jordy says, well, it'll take however many hours, he said. I don't remember off the top of my head anymore. And Scotty yeah. said, you didn't tell him how long it'll really take, did you? Are you crazy? Mm-hmm. So you've got like the, by the book, I'm going to be super honest, Jordy. And then you've got the miracle worker, Scotty. And for that to come back as sort of the basis for Temporal Edict, I thought was fun and clever. But I do agree with you that it went in a weird direction where it did become like a, a sitcom, just a generic sitcom mm-hmm. thing where Freeman is so and then- concerned with time. And then at the end, it kind of, and it got, it got sitcom me with, you know, well, no, we're going to name it the Boimler effect. No, don't name it. That was a, but then when she hands him the plaque, I was like, oh, they've done a complete <laughs> Okudogram registration plaque thing. And then the tag, the epilogue at, on the classroom planet where it's like, it's like Hoshi with yeah. her kids or it's like the, the yeah. scene from I've gone blank. But yeah, and then and then the ultimate punchline there with spoilers, the O'Brien statue is hysterical. Yeah, it's just like out of left field, you know. I thought it was funny though, because O'Brien Oh, I thought it was funny too, don't get me wrong. Right. It was just out of left field. Who's been there since Encounter at Far Point all the way through to the end of Mm DS9, who started as just an enlisted guy who ends up going to head up teaching engineering at the academy, right? That, and there's so many things that happen on DS9 where they're only solved because he's a normal guy, it's his ingenuity, mm-hmm. and he's not a by the book, I've sat in a classroom and learned everything about engineering kind of a thing. So I thought that was kind of a funny reference. In a future ep- I did see this leak, Chris. Did you see this leak that Mike admitted that in a future episode, I think at the early, the second episode of season two, one of those legacy characters is going to be O'Brien and, and it's back on the, it's back when the keto was docked at DS9 and Boimler is sitting there trying to figure out how to roll up her sleeves and O'Brien walks by and shows her the secret to how to do it in a Starfleet gray top. Oh, I see. I'm waiting for that one. Too, but, too but, much? But, I, I just hope Starfleet Intelligence is not listening up. to this episode. And <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I but just think that's like the two. Who are the two rolled up sleeve people of Starfleet? We know. It's O'Brien and Beckett Mariner. This story connected with me also, though, in terms of my own work, where you've got this person who's pushing and pushing and giving you ridiculous deadlines and refusing to listen when you explain why this isn't possible and then throw something else at you because when the aliens get on the ship, she's telling everybody, I want you to take them all out, but don't let it take away from any of the other work that right, you're already right. doing. You you have to multitask. Mm-hmm. And it was that kind of frantic. It was like um, a commentary on the modern workplace, which... Mm-hmm. Connected with me anyway, but maybe my favorite part of this episode, though, is the very beginning where Boimler's playing his fiddle. Yeah. Yeah. And then Mariner and Tindy come in with the drums and and the guitar. And it's just that that classic thing where, especially on the Enterprise D, everyone would gather to watch Mm -hmm. someone perform music or do a stage play or read poetry. That that was a nice little touch yeah and then we and then <laughs> and then freeman introduces the guy doing the united federation of what characters of characters yeah <laughs> he yeah, turns around yeah, he's yeah. like i didn't see you beam in <laughs> <laughs> oh hello i didn't see you. and she's and, again poking her eyes out it's, and sure it's boredom. even funnier because the name is funny the mm-hmm. United Federation of Characters. But what makes it even funnier is that he has that one line and then they cut. 
If they had actually shown him doing anything, it would have spoiled oh, right. it. <laughs> no, it's the whole it's the whole and you know what they've they come and go with this, but there's at least one act out. I say act out. I don't mean like a teenager acting out. I mean an act out moment, the 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 last line of an act before what would be the commercial, yeah. but we don't have commercials here. But those takeaway in the pilot it was her hologram program of the nude Greco-Roman Olympic athletes <laughs> it's the, training. It's the all nude Olympic training center. Yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> oh, it's very specific. <laughs> Bang, cut. <laughs> right. You leave on that. And that's just and a comedy that. thing. That's just a comedy yeah. thing. It's like it's like the inverse of the whole we we jump into the scene when they're telling the punchline of the joke and everybody laughs uproariously. And the joke yeah. the punchline sounds funny. Like I said with the what's it egg sack. You know, it's that old thing where you get into the writers don't have to write yeah. a, a real joke that's right. hysterical. We just right. see the but that's the inverse where you get the setup. And they leave and they cut on that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So that that was fun. And then Cupid's Arrow and Arrow, we've talked about quite a lot with the parasite and such. One thing that was in there, though, that was interesting in terms of something I've always thought about with Star Trek is how would people on different ships actually have any kind of relationship with one another? Because you mm-hmm. just would never see each other. It would be so uncommon. Well, that's why they, you know, that's why the next gen came. I mean, people go back and criticize the different series. But again, you know, my my pendulum theory, things come along later to replace something that was a criticism of an earlier show. And the families were criticized. But that was the whole point of getting away from the military thing of you. It's either career or family. You can't have both. And so that's what that was about. And people still criticize, oh, you're taking families into battle. and Kind of interesting, kind of fun. You hear references in Star Trek about, you know, people who are on different ships and maybe they have some kind of relationship. But the idea here, mm-hmm. you know, people often say, you know, like, I'll see you see around. I think of like at the end of Star Trek Four when Kirk asks Jillian, Where, well, how will I find yes. you? She's like, I'll find you because yes. they're going off on different ships. And you just, you know, it's the last time you're going to see each other. Most likely, unless it's just a moment. Yeah, even though they're staying in the same century. That was, you know, the, it's interesting mm-hmm. to go back now and you think about the original series and then the movie started to unroll and uh, the comfort zone. And then it happened with Next Generation, referring back to, if not specifically, but to, to tropes and memes and moments of the original series and the movies and then the Next Gen movies. And you start having those moments, and that was one of them, Kirk and Jillian, were the whole Kirk the Lady Killer thing although sometimes it was only strategic (laughs) it was a tactic but that's the first time when you think okay and then they're going to run off together it's like no she tells him no it's like oh look that was one of those moments when things shifted a little bit you know got a little self-referential now it's like you know it's that's all that's not all that's that's a big chunk of lord dex is pulling those memes out and Mm -hmm. making fun of them another thing about about cupid's air and arrow was the whole thing with aside from i just have to know where they whoever came up with the name ron docent just like what does that refer to (laughs) and then when he said at the end he's like this is not who ron emmanuel docent is i was like wait is he the first person to get a middle name (laughs) in the whole series so far i don't i don't think so but i i haven't yeah, yeah in this series i i don't know but the whole thing about he was under stress for being on a hero ship and just wanted to go slough off. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I thought that's original. And and again, that part I of liked this as whole well. underbelly yeah. of Starfleet that were, yeah. Yeah. And and that could even be commentary. I mean, that can be commentary on The Next Generation or DS9 or Voyager or whatever. But it could also be commentary on the two new Star Trek series and how the stakes are just so high mm-hmm. all the time. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, why it's don't like we the just only go ship in the quadrant? Yeah. yeah. Okay, remember, we used to be explorers. But also, it's hysterical at the end. Someone went, uh, yeah, but too bad that I've recorded our entire conversation up here that I can play at the court martial. That was Rutherford, yeah, because he has the, he's got his Google Glass on, you know. Yes. So, so I, and the guy goes, <laughs> oh, okay then, here you go. <laughs> it was just a quick boom, <laughs> boom. So it was comedy. But it was like, it was like interesting yeah. thing for we we're talking about how Rutherford's so undeveloped. It's like he's no he's no sap. Sometimes he comes off as almost as googie as Tendy does, you know. Yeah. But they both they've taken a thing where they're both kind of can be just science techie nerds, but she's yeah. like, I'm gonna kill you if you don't love me. Now not really, but she can have that mania and him and the I'll st- I'd rather sit in the in the tubes all week until I can say I've got them done and do the boring thing or whatever, and then still 
go date the girl and even though the in the pilot and even though you know he's it's he's all hung up on his tech and doesn't notice her throwing herself at him and that's kind of yeah. an old you know an old joke but then yeah. he's a with it and he's aware and a with it enough to <laughs> say i've recorded our whole conversation so you know anyway i look yeah. forward to all these guys and yeah. gals getting um and i want to well, know who the blue skinned aliens are with the gills and the droopy po- oh and did you see in um cupid's Aaron arrow on the Vancouver, there's another one of those species members, and it's when he's trying to blame the goofball thing when he's embarrassing her in the mess hall because he's jealous. And uh-huh. the one walks behind and says, "Yeah, yeah, don't do that to her." And he just kind of waves oh, as he yeah, goes by. Yeah. It has like a, it's yeah. like a, it's like what a, <laughs> it's like a cation paw looked like in the, or what yeah. a tellerite hoof ought to look like if it was small yeah. like a cat. So there's another detail about those guys that we don't really know what they are, and I don't know if they're that character from the pilot of Discovery or not, because anyway, we'll wait. Have to go look again. Yeah. One thing about this entire series is I don't think there's a single thing aside from the blooper of Boimler being in the in the reflection in the first episode and his combat it was it was not reflected when she's looking at mm-hmm. her glass. And I noticed later on there's another scene in later one of these last two where Ransom is doing the same thing and he's reflected. Mm-hmm. And boy, you better know that his combat is on the right side. Yeah, <laughs> his reflection right. has really been drawn. Maybe there's hidden meaning in that, Larry. Maybe it's not a blooper. Maybe mm. they're trying to say something. It's a it's a vampire shapeshifter. I don't I don't yeah, maybe you have something there, Chris. One thing I'm looking forward to, Larry, as we look ahead to what's gonna come in the next five episodes to wrap up the season, there's this scene they keep throwing into the teasers of later this season on Lower Decks. Mm-hmm. And it's when they're they're down on some planet and they're in a chamber and there's this alien guy and he says, with this horn, you can only speak the truth. And Rutherford goes, happy to be here. <laughs> Just that little <laughs> thing. Because like, they don't look like they're happy to be there. <laughs> so I cannot wait to find out what that's about. Oh, uh, well, that's coming down the pike. Yeah. 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 No, again, I, I sounds boring to say, but I'm having a blast with it. I was trying to make the point, I think, that whatever is happening here, aside from the reflection being bad on that, maybe an error, a blooper, you know, for real. Mm-hmm. I cannot imagine. There's, there is so much detail. It goes beyond Easter eggs. There is so much bizarre background whatever and i know mike probably isn't responsible for all of it he's got a huge team there's there's 4700 animators at the end credits if in case you hadn't noticed and Mm. all the writers i just have to think they're pretty much on top of everything going on or there's at least a a, a process to somebody to throw something in and then get it approved or it comes down the you know if comes from top Mm. down whatever and it's just very hard for me to think that there's something going by in here that's an accident (laughs) <laughs> it just yeah, feels like right. 99.9% of everything is very intentional. Even if it's just a, we need something here. Oh, say a so-and-so. Okay, cool. Just because in the back of your mind, you go, you know what? No one ever mentions the so-and-so. No one ever mentions the Breen. Throw a Breen in there. Yeah. And I just, as this unravels, and as if the clues that Mike has given so far, just not even so much about detail, but structure and the general flow of the season – it's really hard for me to imagine anything that we're talking about right now is not in there for a reason that wasn't a happy accident, right, uh, even right. if it was just a total throwaway happy accident. So anyway, I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing what um, <laughs> what comes yeah. a lot of this and watching the same watching here. the Mariner development develop the backstory. Yeah, yeah, same here. I think uh, we've got some good stuff ahead of us. Uh, mm-hmm. at least based on what we've seen so far with the series and probably will continue to win more fans over to this. Not everyone, because I can I can perfectly understand why some people just need Star Trek to be more serious mm-hmm. and maybe this type of comedy doesn't work for them. But they've just done so much better with the series than I anticipated. So I'm very happy with it. I just, every day, I see more and more people proclaim... I, you know, sometimes they're brazen about it and sometimes they're almost apologetic, but they say, I'm, I'm enjoying this more than I enjoyed Discovery and even Picard. It's kind of cute mm-hmm. almost. It's like people are going, Oh my God. And whether they said they wouldn't or not, it's just the revelation that the, the Star Trek they're enjoying right now is drawn and not filmed in live action. It's been kind of interesting to watch, watch that develop. Mm-hmm. And I, and I just, yeah. 
Well, Larry, we've been talking for way over two hours, so we oh should God. wrap up. But we are recording this on Star Trek Day here in Japan. And by now, when we started, it was almost Star Trek Day for you in Los <laughs> Angeles. It and is. And now it yes. officially is Star Trek Day. So I'm wondering, you know, I'm not doing much to celebrate Star Trek Day. I'm just eating a lot of salt. But what are you doing <laughs> to celebrate Star Trek Day? Because I'm, I'm assuming you've got some kind of panels or some kind of stuff going on over there. I know a lot of stuff is happening. Well, here's the thing. Uh, CBS decided to pull probably their biggest promotional day ever for a Star Trek Day and have right. these yeah, three like hours it. of half-hour panels. And it turned out that um, I was going to have a topic for Star Trek Day and look at it in context because I have some definite ideas and, and insights on that. And then I realized that the time I normally do Trekland Tuesdays Live at 1 Pacific was right when the Strange uh, New Worlds panel was going to kick off with mm -hmm. Henry Alonzo Myers and a couple of the other writers and we've, we've never really been introduced to. So my present, what I did for Star Trek Day was move my show up a day earlier. So we did Trekland Tuesdays Live on Monday so I could say my piece and also hopefully point a lot more people to all the events going on today. That's how I celebrated Star Trek Day today. I see. It's exciting that they have so many things going on, though. It really, really highlights how mm -hmm. big Star Trek is at the moment, how much energy the studio is putting into it, which is a wonderful thing. And we're getting so much great content, mm -hmm. like the stuff we talked about today. And again, the intersection of uh, the pandemic and the vir you know virtuality yeah. saving fandom and saving live events in general and saving a chunk of culture and entertainment. Not just in our little Star Trek niche, but sci-fi, pop culture, and across the board. But how much of it, it may be residual? How much is going to hang around? This right. would not have happened yeah. had we not had the pandemic year here and all the shutdowns exactly. and people getting cozy yeah. with virtual streaming and all that. So, and it's something that is, you know, a, a promoter, a, an owner of a franchise like CBS. We just saw DC Fandom happen. It's evolved so quickly from March and April, and everybody, what? What is this? To the cons doing replacement conventions, to agents and promoters doing it on their own, and then the, the franchise is stepping in. And this could be even a model for what CBS may try to do more of next year. I don't think they'll they'll bypass having, you know, licensed conventions and that kind of thing. But something they can do on their own terms without a huge overhead outlay. I'm keeping my eye out. I, this is what I said today on Trekline Mondays Live. Was this the very last thing to think about with this is it's a big promotional deal. It's their, their goals aren't the same. They're not in a money making situation. They're not fans enjoying their, you know, it's not a nonprofit convention. It's not a, it's not a, a pay for profit convention. They're still, mm -hmm. it's promotion for them. And they're taking the time to Star Trek to honor the legacy shows as well as promote the current shows. And it's all there, but who knows where this might grow in the future and look how it's been amped up. With the ability of, of virtuality, where it's not just to go have the overhead of having a live event right? or, or produce a special, a whole new entity to, to show. Um, yeah. So anyway, it could be that it could, this could herald something big every year. Yeah. And, and as long as, as well, long as there's new content coming, it's worth it. Yeah. Well, one thing that I end up doing a lot in my writing for the business magazines is trying to find silver linings in the pandemic. And if mm -hmm. we look at Star Trek... This is one of the silver linings because not only does the studio, uh, vendors, creation, whoever puts on the various mm -hmm. events, not only do they not have as much overhead to do something virtually as they would if they were doing it right. in Las Vegas or elsewhere, so many more fans can participate who yes. otherwise wouldn't be able to participate. So that is of great business benefit to the franchise and to the studio. And as you were saying, there could be a lot of residual benefit from this next year, year after, kind of indefinitely ongoing. And the pandemic, of course, is terrible and is causing a lot of problems for people's individual lives and for business. Right. But this is one of those opportunities where it could actually boost the health of the Star Trek franchise for years to come. And then we benefit as fans in new content that we end up getting as a result of the increased participation. It's like after the pandemic flu, basically culturally, people stopped spitting on sidewalks. 
Yeah. <laughs> okay, maybe it's not exactly like that, but that did happen. <laughs> Sales of so, spittoons um, dried up overnight after 1919. <laughs> oh, God, spittoon. I remember my great-grandfather kept one by his chair. Mm-hmm. See? In the living room. No, in the same living room thing, yes. where I watched Star Trek for the very first time when I was like five oh. years old. So I have Wow, a, see? You, you, you just triggered my memory of becoming a Star Trek fan there. Bring it full Thanks circle, Chris. We bring it full circle. Yeah. Larry, do you think Durango has a... Spittoon, because I think he does, <laughs> right next to his captain's I'm, chair. I'm not going to indulge in any more <laughs> Tellarite specious tropes. You won't lure me there, Mr. Jones. You won't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, in addition to Trekland Tuesdays Live, which we just talked about, what else do you have going on? Where else should people go find you? If they want to talk to you, if they want to partake of your vast Star Trek knowledge and <laughs> Portal 47 offerings and all that stuff. All of that. Well, LarryNimichek.com is always on, on the web page is the hub and at Larry Nimichek on Twitter and Larry Nimichek's Trekland on Facebook, which is also my Instagram account. Right now, we're building up the YouTube channel and you can go to Larry Nimichek on YouTube. That's pretty simple. All the live shows are posted there and a lot of my old interviews. And Chris, now that the new iMac is finally sitting on my desk, I've got 40 or 50 back interview guest interviews with actors and people to get going, which I won't happen overnight, but at well, least it can start happening now. <laughs> does this mean that we might be producing a new Trek Land audio CD sometime in the future, Larry? I know, I know, I know. This is like the <laughs> pandemic would slow everything down. Like I might even get my documentary finished, The Connor Raft, but... It's like we all had to learn new gears, even as we weren't doing stuff. We just weren't doing the old, and we had to turn and, and do this. Yeah. But one of the new things on Saturdays, I have to say, also is Life Support Live, which we say is uh, we're boldly going through uncertain times. And Dr. Trek and Dr. Ali Matu. The real doctor. One of yeah. us is a real doctor, actually. 10 a.m. Saturdays Pacific our end around the world. It's big enough for everybody, uh, most time zones to catch us live. And we have a really good time there. We geek out, but offer some mental health uh, tips and takeaways that you can do. I know it'll be after the fact, but <laughs> Dr. Ali was a little under the weather and we couldn't do our last episode last week. So we're make, doing a makeup Wednesday and then we'll be back on track on Saturday. But that's all at my YouTube channel too. So I hope everybody can go and subscribe. If people will save the date at the end of October... October 28th right now is our annual anniversary open house. This will be the fifth anniversary for Portal 47, and we open the doors, and we have a great guest. We've had Mike Westmore and Robert hewitt Wolf and Renee Chavaria, Robert Butler, who directed The Cage, and uh, we're going to be announcing the guest is a great one and a modern Trek person, as long as schedules hold up. That'll be the 20th of October. It's not Mariner, right? You're not going to have, like, animated Mariner on there, right? <sighs> She's too unpredictable. I would not want to guest <laughs> handle her for a convention at all. She'd be walking to the dealer's room, see a batleth, and go bonkers on somebody. What do right. you think, Chris? Think so. You think I was bored She'd be yesterday? drunk on Romulan whiskey, no doubt. I'll I'll leave her to somebody else to, to headache through on <laughs> her first live event. No, so save the date, Wednesday the 28th. It'll be in the evening. It'll be 7 p.m. Pacific, which is normally when we have Portal 47 for all the members our live events, our telebriefings are then. But anyway, that's the big news. There's also another live event that I'm not at liberty to announce yet that'll be at the end of September. It'll be here in Los Angeles, but it'll be virtual and a lot of fun. And uh, hopefully next time we talk, I can spread joy about that too or let everybody out there know. Again, go to LarryNemichek.com, get on my news list, get on all the pages, and you'll be sure to hear about it. I'm not alone, it's, <laughs> I'm, but I'm getting to be a co-host, so I'm really excited about that, and I won't tease you anymore. So, yes, we're coming out <laughs> of the funny. pandemic, and somehow uh, the rest of the time I'll be sitting here getting my – nursing my new little iMac, uh, all the yeah. quirks of all the apps to update and everything. It's amazing. It's like raising a baby. Yeah, I liked your reaction to my reply to your tweet about completing the switchover and putting the old iMac to bed and – I just replied to you with the photo of the torpedo tube <laughs> being shot out at the end of the Wrath of Khan, and you you sent me back a face, like very worried, and I had to explain to you that it's not about Spock, that's your old iMac, and we're going to shoot it out. I was so relieved. We're honoring all the calculations that it's done, we're honoring mm -hmm. its years of service and friendship to you, and I know that soon you and I are going to hijack a ship. 
we're going to steal a ship and we're going to go and we're going to retrieve that iMac and we're going to find a new <laughs> shiny new iMac with Apple Silicon inside just waiting for an OS reinstall. And a bunch of giant worms outside. Yeah. <laughs> Going lever, 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 lever. <laughs> you know, we're really cross extremes, even within Star Trek. Uh, yeah, yeah. All right. Good. Hello, my iMac. Right. Hello, my baby. Hello, my... Yes. <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, if you would like to find me, you can find me on Twitter. I don't have as much going on as Larry does in terms of Star Trek activities, but you can find me on Twitter. My username is C Brian Jones, the letter C and Brian with a Y. I do other podcasts here on the network. I mentioned Interphase earlier. That's my new Star Trek Universe podcast where I'm just covering everything in Star Trek. I also do Literary Treks with Matthew Rushing, where we talk about Star Trek books and comics. We had author David Mack on the most recent episode to talk about his book, More Beautiful Than Death, and we'll be recording a new episode coming up in a couple of weeks. Matthew and I also do The Orb together, which is our Deep Space Nine podcast, and we're going to be recording some new episodes of that soon also. And then I have a few other things in the works as well. So just uh, keep an eye on the network, keep an eye on the master feed, and you'll see those things come through. And that's about it in terms of what I'm doing in the Star Trek world at the moment. But again, if you would like to chat, Twitter's the best place. That's where I'm most active. If you'd like to share your thoughts on today's episode, there are many ways to do that. The best place to go is the Babel Conference. That's our listeners group on Facebook. Just type Babel, B-A-B-E-L, if you're not already a member, and it should come up. If you're joining for the first time, it is a closed group, so you need to answer a few questions so that I can let you in. And then you can join in the conversation with fellow listeners and hosts over there in that space. You can also send email if you'd like. Just go to our website, trek.fm slash contact and use the form there. Choose to send to a show and choose the ready room and that will come to me by email. If you'd like to help us keep the shows coming, we could definitely use your help. It takes a lot of money, a lot of resources to produce the shows on the network and to distribute them. And if you would like to help us out, you can do that at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash trek-f-m. You can find out uh, what kind of perks we have. We have the round table, which is very popular, where our listeners get together and talk about Star Trek with each other and hosts in the same format as we do in the podcasts. And then we publish that out in the master feed for everyone to listen to. And you can also become an associate producer of your favorite show. And we have other perks as well. So please check that out at patreon.com slash Trek FM. And I'd like to say thank you to everyone who is supporting not only the Ready Room, but all of our shows for your help. It really means a great deal to us. All right, Larry. Well, I did not expect us to have such a long discussion about Lower Decks, although we did talk about five it's episodes. It's a half season, Chris. It's, it's a, a half, half season. season. It's a half season. We did talk about a lot of stories, and also it was our first time to talk about actually seeing the the execution of this idea that we had been hearing about for so long. So uh, no surprise there. But anyway, we will at least do this again at the end of the season to talk about the back five, the second half of the season, and do a wrap up of Lower Decks before we head into season three of Discovery. Yeah, Chris, it has been over two hours, so I think we're way overdue to stick a retro throwback 2260s alien spear in it, because the ready room is done. Ready room.